Buongiorno. Good morning, everybody, to the final day of our conference and um, this morning's session, which is Warrior Women Representation and Iconography One. And we'll start with an online presentation by Leah Ver Vega. I hope I've pronounced that right. Leah is a doctoral candidate supervised by Professor Alexander Ma in the Department of History of Art at the University of Cambridge and a doctoral fellow with 4A Lab, a collaboration of the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence and the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation Berlin. She has previously worked as a research assistant at the National Gallery London. Leah obtained her MA in Art History, Curatorship and Renaissance Culture at the Warburg Institute London with a dissertation on the naked Judith in 16th century Northern European art and her BA in History of Art at the Albert Ludwigs University Freiburg. Leah's PhD explores the meaning of plants in 15th and 16th century German visual culture. She focuses on gender specific attitudes to plants expressed in writings on medicine, marriage and faith, and analyzes their impact on objects from brisket, from, from biscuit molds to portraits of women. Leia continues to work on representations of the naked Judith in Northern art. And sh today she will be looking at, uh, at this topic, undressing the woman warrior, Conrad Mates Judith, re-evaluated. Thank you, Leia. Welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me because unfortunately I could not hear anything um, of the kind of introduction. I'm sorry. Um, could you not, if you can hear me, please? Hello? This worked earlier. <laughs> you, you. Hi. Um, can anyone hear me? Yes? Is that a yes? Is that a thumbs up? Great, okay, then I'll just start and um, hope it'll work itself out. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, apologies for the technical glitch, apparently. Um, it's been an amazing conference so far already, and I'm very curious to hear the papers that will be coming after me today as well. Um, I will be focusing today on um, one particular sculpture by Conrad Might. Um, which dates to approximately 1526 to 28, and um, how uh, this sculpture undresses the woman warrior, Judith. This is her. <laughs> um, uh, to begin with, I will have to give a little bit... Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, to begin with, I will have to give a little bit of a sort of background um, information and kind of set the scene. So uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Book of Judith, but I'll just recap a little bit. Um, the Book of Judith was originally included in St. Jerome's Vulgate, Old Testament, um, and much of his writings about Judith actually informed um, or was the basis of her literary and visual afterlife. According to the Book of Judith, the chaste and childless widow Judith lived her quiet life in contemplation and devotion to God. Uh, until the day that Israel's enemy Nebuchadnezzar and his general Holofernes besieged uh, the town of Bethulia is where Judith lived. And this is the moment where Judith decides to act. Um, with God's blessing, she uh, dons fine dress and jewelry and she sneaks out of Bethulia and into Holofernes' camp. And in the camp, her beauty and her elegant words completely stun Holofernes and he believes that she wants to aid him in his conquest of Israel and he permits her to stay in his camp. So three days pass and they're both in that camp um, and Holofernes finally decides that he will either seduce or rape this beautiful widow and he invites her to a banquet and as this dinner unfolds Holofernes drinks more and more until he is literally oblivious with drunkenness and passes out. And this is the moment that Judith finds herself alone with him and she seizes this opportunity and takes up his sword, sends prayers to the heavens and cuts Holofernes' head in two strokes, to be precise. Um, after this, she bags the head and she heads back to Bethulia. And the next morning, Holofernes' army wakes up to finding their general's head dangling from the battlements. And they're absolutely terrified, not just of this head dangling from the battlements, but also about of, of hearing that it was a woman who murdered their general. And they flee in fear, 
and Israel is saved. Uh, Judith, meanwhile, returns to her previous life. She declines all the offers of marriages that she receives, and she remains the pious and chaste widow that she had been before her heroic deed. Um, throughout the centuries, Judith was celebrated as a Christian exemplar, and writers ranging, as I said, from St. Jerome to de, de Pizan, from Erasmus to Agrippa of Nettesheim, recommended Judith for emulation to both women and also men, actually. Um, in the Christian tradition, Eve and had proven woman's incapability of rational behavior when she gave in to the snake's temptation. And as a result, even all her daughters were relegated to the irrational realm um, of the sensuous body and to the private sphere, as we've already heard um, in the last two days, of house and family. Well, obviously the rational world and the public sphere of political action was reserved for men. And war was obviously the prime example of this political public realm. So Judith appears an absolute, as an absolute exception. She had experienced the holy state of matrimony, and even though she obviously wasn't a virgin anymore, her chaste life allowed her to obtain exceptional virile strength. And this status kind of permitted her to step out of her womenly private sphere and into the public realm of warring men with God's explicit approval on top of that. But throughout all of this and throughout all the approval that she received, she did remain a woman who murdered a man. So her position is very fragile. There is a simultaneous awe and fear of a woman warrior who could carry out such a deed. And this fuels the heroine's perception as a kind of wily temptress. Um, and I think testament to just how unsettling the act of a woman killing a man was to contemporary uh, Northern European audience is the fact that from the late 15th century, Onwards, Judith was often included among Samson and Delilah or Aristotle and Phyllis as examples of women who had conquered power men, powerful men through seduction. And in all of this, the kind of determining factor, the deciding factor, whether Judith is perceived as heroic war, warrior or as a dangerous temptress is the matter of her chastity. So this presents a bit of a problem we can see here in the round, clearly naked, <laughs> not textual whatsoever. And um, this is a bit of a tradition because uh, by the early 16th century appear many, many depictions, not sculptures as far as I know, um, but depictions, print and paintings, um, which show Judith in various states of undress. This also happens in an Italian context, but there this development appears chiefly as part of a sort of classicizing heroization of Judith. So I'll be focusing on the northern on the northern problem. Because in the north, the nudity of the Judith kind of serves as a, as a massive problem because it directly associates her with figures such as Delilah or Phyllis, who did have sexual relations with the men that they conquered. And it also creates a very obvious visual link with the most commonly naked woman in northern art, Eve. Um, so it accentuates Judith belonging to the female realm of the bodily, of the home and of the irrational. And lastly, especially these depictions of Judith that show her in a partially undressed state, incinerate a very different narrative to her story. They make his question, did Holofernes maybe in the end succeed? Did he seduce or rape Judith? Maybe she didn't remain chaste after all. And if she did not remain chaste, she was definitely not permitted whatsoever to pick up a man's weapon to kill a man. Um, art historical research generally agrees that in this Northern European depictions, the naked Judith is, and I quote here, monstrous or erotic. She's robbed of her exemplary position. She's limited to her sensuality and she's related to wily women. So in conclusion, a rather negative figure and not at all the role model that she's made out to be. So now equipped with all this background information, we can return hopefully to um, Conrad Mites Judith uh, with the head of Holofernes. Uh, this is a very small alabaster sculpture. It measures only around um, 30 centimeters in height. Ooh, I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, it's now in the Bayerische Nationalmuseum in Munich and it was likely created between 1526 and 1528 or 29 in Mechelen in the Netherlands. Um, the dating is based on um, comparisons to other dated works, so there's a certain amount of flexibility there. We see her, a naked woman, woman standing on a classicizing base. With her right hand, she keeps a long metal sword by her side, while with her left hand, she places a deca decapitated head on a plinth. The white alabaster sculpture is partially painted. You can see it in the hair. 
and the lips as well. Um, while with her left, sorry, um, and she has there are several fractures in the in the alabaster that are sealed with wax. Uh, and actually, her right hand and her sword are 19th century replacements. On the classicizing base of the sculpture, we read in gilded letters, Conrad might von Worms, so Conrad might von Worms. Uh, Conrad might himself, who was originally born, as you can tell, in Worms, in Germany, between 1470 and 1485, and he later died in Antwerp uh, around 1550. And for a large portion of his life, uh, from 15. 12 to her death in 1530, Might was the court sculpture of Margaret of Austria in Mechelen. Um, Margaret was the daughter of Emperor Maximilian I. She had been married and widowed twice at a very young age. And during her second childless marriage, she managed most of the political affairs of her husband, Duke Philibert of Savoy. After his death, she successfully negotiated that she would be permitted to remain unmarried and a widow. And thanks to her political expertise and diplomatic skill and her relative independence as a childless widow, she became regent of the Netherlands in 1509. And she was also later governess to Charles, the later emperor, Charles V. So she was in the middle of a lot of sort of political um, happenings and um, had a hand in the education of the future emperor. In the 1520s, might was already firmly established at Margaret's court. And it appears very likely that Judith the Judas that we see here was created by order of, or at least in the immediate environment of the female ruler. Ruler, and this is further, further supported by the fact that Margaret stylized herself as a Judith to legitimize her regency as a widow and as a woman. Uh, Margaret was very interested in classical and Renaissance art, and she fostered a climate of very creative and intellectual exchange at her court. And she proudly displayed Might's nudes. There are several others, mostly Eves. Um, in the library, which was the representational room in which she received humanists like Erasmus or Agrippa for Nettesheim. And thankfully, we know from a contract which might annotate it in French that the sculpture actually received some form of education. Um, so he could read and write. He did, spoke, did speak German and French and uh, probably Dutch as well. And he engaged very actively with his creative uh, humanist environment. Uh, he was working alongside Jacobo de Babay, and he met both Albrecht Dürer and uh, Jan Gossard. So he was exposed to Renaissance ideas and ideals, which are very evident in the sculpture. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I will not be able to go into much detail um, of these classicizing influences, but I will instead focus solely on the rather obvious aspect of her nudity. And um, this is a nudity, I, I think I probably have to point out, that doesn't really follow classical ideals of proportion and beauty, but we see a nude that seems rooted in a, a more Gothic tradition. We have a round soft belly that trans transitions into a very elongated torso with small breasts that sit far apart from each other and very close to the pits of her arms. And um, you have these very noticeably slanting muscular shoulders and arms of her. So if Judith is not primarily emulating the fashionable Italian Renaissance nude, why does he render Judith naked? It's not like this is a textual base to this. Um, one potential influence on Knight's Judith, and this was first proposed by Jens Burg, the curator of the um, Biological Science Museum, um, one influence may have been a Grippe von Nettersheim lecture on the nobility and preeminence of the female sex, which he delivered in 1509 at the University of Dole. Um, this lecture was circulating already and caused a bit of a hubbub and was actually only published quite a bit later in 1529 in Antwerp. And he dedicated it uh, to Margaret of Austria uh, because he sought her patronage at the time. And there's, there was a, a, an exchange between these two. They met in person in said library. Um, so he was around her and, and she was well aware of these ideas and, his, and her court as well. Um, in his lecture, Agrippa argues the case for women's superiority over men. To support this claim, he cites biblical passages as well as philosophers and other authors, and he concludes that while both men and women are equal due to the divine essence of their souls, in everything else that constitutes human being, women is superior to man. And if we look closely at his arguments, we notice that um, they oddly mimic, mimic my Judith. So um, the way that he describes female beauty as being the radiance of the divine uh, he almost seems to describe the sculpture, or rather maybe might seems to emulate his writings. Um, he decidedly, Agrippa decidedly um, defines female beauty based 
or through the naked female form. So the undressed body of a pre-fall Eve. Um, he describes the softness of the female body to sight and touch, women's fair complexion and uh, sort of very pale, shiny skin, silky hair, which shines subtly, and women's sparkling eyes and red symmetrical mouth. Um, Might's sculpture was supposed to be touched. Um, these small sculptures were supposed to be handled, and the alabaster would have been decidedly soft and subtle to touch. And um, the painted, I'm not sure you can see it very well, but her lips are painted red and her hair would have had a gold machine when light hit it. Um, so this is echoing Agrippa's description of female beauty and matching his ideal, Agrippa's ideal of female beauty too, are her curiously sloping shoulders, for example, and the roundness of her belly, the full hips and the thighs. Um, Agrippa also speaks of the modest bearing of women and the propriety of movement. And um, we notice clearly that Judith is not actually returning the viewer's gaze, but she's modestly tilting her head, looking down, and she's appearing very chaste and decent rather than boisterous of this incredible accomplishment. Um, including, intriguingly, Agrippa finds evidence of woman's superiority even in her genitals. Uh, he points out that even here, women is, woman is designed more modest and chaste than man because her reproductive organs are located, located in a concealed, secret place. Might this be the reason for might to decidedly expose Judith's womb? We have to consider here that might is among the very first to show an undressed Judith, and he does so without any clothing or any sort of modesty veil. Does might choose to display that there is actually not much to display since Judith's womb and genitalia are concealed in her secret and secure place? Um, one final point that Agrippa makes is that uh, demons regularly perish with passionate love for women's beauty. And might sculpture seems to actually visualize this. A dangerous demon per perished as a result of his passion for the beautiful Judith. In medieval typology, Judith's victory over Holofernes is often equated with Mary's victory over the devil, and Holofernes is often interpreted as a variation of Satan. In the case of Mice Judith, the severed head on the plinth serves as a proof that woman's divine beauty holds the power to overcome even the most demonic vices. She herself, Judith herself, positions Holofernes' head on the pedestal at the same height as her womb. She seems to proudly present the evidence that her sex vanquished the devil. If we look a little closer, though, at this supposedly vanquished demon Holofernes, um, we see a head, a face of a man that is suffering and quite beautiful in a way. Um, he, while Judith doesn't make eye contact with the viewer, Holofernes does seem to do. Um, his pitying state almost arouses compassion with the viewer. And we are actually strongly reminded of images of the suffering Christ, for example, or of the head of John the Baptist. So we see here um, another sculpture by Might um, a Pieta and a, and a detail of the head of Christ. And um, there's another important, I think, visual comparison that we have to acknowledge, and that is the tradition of the head of John the Baptist. So especially in the Netherlands and also in Germany um, appeared the severed head of John the Baptist as, as it had been presented to Salome on a platter as a separate iconography. And here we see an alabaster head that originated in the late 15th century, which is now in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Looking at these heads together, there's a striking resemblance. And um, we can't help but wonder whether Mike drew inspiration. He would have known these, these heads of John the Baptist. And we can't help but wonder whether he drew inspiration inspiration for his Holofernes there. And if this head of Holofernes resembles that of John the Baptist, what does that mean for Judith? What does that mean for our warrior? Does that mean she resembles a Salome? The iconographies of Judith and Salome do conflate very often. And usually the distinguishing attribute between the both of them is the sword. The sword is Judith's honorific attribute. Um, the one that unites her with personifications of virtue, such as fortitude or justice and that she shares with many martyrs. Uh, you have to have a little detour to the provenance here, because as you might have remember, the sword and her right hand aren't actually original to the sculpture. So the sword <laughs> that is distinguishing Judith from Salome wasn't originally there when the sculpture was found. And thankfully we have a, um, a record, an inventory record in Castle Ambas 
from 1806. And this is the first time that the sculpture is given an, an iconography of Judith before she was always referred to as a woman with a dead head on a pedestal or a naked woman with a dead head on a pedestal. And um, this record now says, Judith made of alabaster, uh, who is the right hand? And then there's something crucial missing here on a pedestal written Conrad Knight from Worms. And thankfully, two years later, we have another record. And that record states a standing Judith of alabaster, but who misses her right hand, one shoe high, on a pedestal is written Conrad Knight from, of Worms. So these sources are A, the first time that Judith is identified as Judith. But it's happening at a moment when she doesn't actually have her second attribute, the sword. And we can't be certain whether she would have had one. There are other examples of, um, of might sculptures being changed in the 20th century, early 20th century, some of the 19th century, in a way that actually wouldn't have been original to the sculptures. Did this happen here? We are left to wonder, was this originally a Judith? Or was this a Salome with a head of John the Baptist? Um, on the whole, I think probably, and you're welcome to disagree with me, or give me examples. So on the whole, uh, I believe that this is still probably a Judith. We don't know for sure whether she didn't have a sword originally, um, but the sculpture was close to the, was sorry, the sculpture was created in such close proximity to Margaret, who styled herself as Judith, um, that it just seems likely that this is a Judith with the head of Holofernes. And maybe more importantly, to my knowledge at least, there exists no uh, example of an undress Salome in art before the 19th century. And this is where I'd like all your help if, if you're willing. Nonetheless, this conflation or this association with Salome through this suffering head of Holofernes that resembles John the Baptist so much, um, we have a potential conflation with Salome and a sort of negativity coming in here. So I'd like to summarize and conclude a little bit now. Um, the appearance of the naked Judith in Northern art questions the biblical figure's chastity, which is the core reason why this woman is gradually permitted to briefly act as a warrior in order to save her people. Concerning my Judith with the head of Holofernes, this means that this figure is kind of teetering on knife's edge between on one hand, glorifying women's naked body as visual evidence of woman's moral superiority, and at the same time, associating her with a sensuous and traditionally evil Salome. I'm sure these dichotomies would have appealed to Margaret of Austria and her court. Each contemporary beholder, for example, may have perceived this woman warrior completely differently. And I would like to end with an appeal for acceptance of the iconographic instability of this Judith. And um, I'd like to argue in favor of a plurality of meaning might play simultaneously with classicizing influences and the Gothic tradition. And he evokes a threatening, deadly female sexuality while at the same time presenting the female nude as evidence of Judith's superiority. Thank you very much. And I hope I can hear you now. Cause... Thank you, Leah, for your presentation. No, I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Um, and uh, a lot of um, ambiguous read, um in that figure, which you've um, explained to us. Yes, we'll, um, we'll, we'll have questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Our next speaker is Margarita Fratar Cangeli. Uh, who is an art historian with a PhD in history and conservation of the objects of art and architecture, the University of Roma Tre. She has held research positions at, university, at universities and collaborates with Italian and foreign superintendencies and, and universities. She has been a scientific assistant at the Biblioteca Erziana in Rome and a fellow at Harvard University Villa Itati in Florence. She's an external collaborator of the Soprintendenza ABAP, ABI API, for the metropolitan area of Rome and the province of Rieti. Her areas of research include the history of collecting and social and economic history, with a focus on the city of Rome and the territory of Lombardy and Lazio in the 17th to the 19th centuries. And today, Margherita will be talking about Dalila Delilah. 
Thank you very much, Margherita. Grazie. Eh, il mio intervento sarà in italiano. Ditemi se funziona. Eh, beh, ringrazio intanto Consuelo e, e Adelina per avermi accolto nella giornata e in generale per l'istituzione. E poi mi sento, anche se non è magari perfettamente il contesto, di, così, di lanciare un pensiero al popolo israeliano e palestinese, ma eh, perché il tema in qualche maniera eh, è in filigrana eh, per loro. Ecco. E, e dunque, anzitutto... Vorrei sottolineare la scelta di intitolare semplicemente il titolo l'intervento Dalila. E, e ovviamente il titolo più naturale sarebbe stato Sansone e Dalila, e, e, ma volevo proprio cercare di riportare sulla figura soltanto femminile eh, di Dalila l'intervento, anche se per farlo dobbiamo passare attraverso Sansone. Eh, non, non esisterebbe Dalila senza Sansone nei nostri racconti. E, eh, quindi leggerò perché vorrei stare nei tempi. Eh, eh, insomma. Quindi eh, inizio con questa frase in latino, ma la traduzione appunto è sotto più o meno una traduzione, eh, che troviamo ehm, nella tela di Mantegna, eh, nella tempera di Mantegna, eh, sull'albero non si vede molto, ma insomma è vergato eh, questa frase, la femmina malvagia è tre volte peggio del diavolo. Eh, la tela è datata a 1480 circa, è un proverbio di origine medievale, eh, non è noto quale motivo Mantegna, il committente, abbia inserito questa eh, epigrafe diciamo sul, nella tela eh, poteva essere inserita qualsiasi altra donna non necessariamente Dalila eh, eh, o viceversa e, e questo un po' ci apre un po' all'età moderna al tema di Dalila e Sansone in età moderna e, eh, beh, sicuramente al di là dell'iscrizione del proverbio che si vede o meno Dalila è ben presente al centro quindi diciamo che prende la scena decisamente. E, eh, a distanza di 150 anni arriva questa quest incisione invece di Claude Mellan, ehm, dove eh, sotto sempre in latino, ma insomma io ho messo una mia traduzione, e se Sansone non avesse abbracciato la sensualità di Dalila non avrebbe perso le forze sensualità, amore, che dir si voglia. Siamo intorno al 1626 e, e ancora una volta è una frase con un'accezione negativa. E, le, le comparo insieme e dico ancora di più negativa perché mentre in uno Dalila non è citata, è un proverbio funzionante per qualsiasi donna, nel secondo invece diventa un'accezione veramente forte perché c'è Dalila eh, chiamata in causa appunto. Eh, come colei che avrebbe poi definitivamente rovinato la vita a Sansone, in qualche maniera. E, ma eh, facendo un po' di ordine, eh, vorrei riprendere brevemente la storia, molto brevemente, di Sansone e Dalila, anche se è abbastanza nota, quindi non entro nei meriti eh, di tante piccoli eh, rivoli, eh, Sansone giudice di Israele, esistito o non esistito, insomma comunque nel libro dei giudici dell'Antico Testamento ne viene narrata eh, la vicenda, ehm, eh, tutta sempre in funzione storico edificativa, lui è sempre considerato una sorta di prefigurazione di Cristo per gli eventi della sua vita, eh, quindi dalla nascita eh, all'uccisione eh, del leone con la mascella d'asino fino all'epilogo della morte, c'è sempre questo paragone con quello che sarà poi il Cristo eh, tutta la vita è spesa per San, viene raccontata come tale è spesa in funzione della liberazione del suo popolo eh, da parte dei filistei eh, ma nelle scritture appunto nel libro dei giudici appare anche come un personaggio insomma in sottofondo ehm, sì grande forza ma che cede molto facilmente alle lusinghe femminili eh, si invaghisce erotivamente serialmente di donne sempre filistee eh, e 
puntualmente c'è questa sorta di perdita della fiducia, di tradimento. Ehm, c'è un filosofo psicanalista Jacques Lacan francese che in uno dei suoi seminari nel 1961, eh, quello dedicato al transfer, eh, citando proprio Sansone, eh, lui esplicita una frase che dice non sono le donne che lo castrano, ovviamente con una lettura psicanalitica, ehm, che lo castrano, ma è l'amore che lo aveva già accecato. Quindi eh, rilegge Sansone, ovviamente portandolo dalla sua parte, ehm, come già un predestinato ad essere eh, tradito. E la prima donna di cui si è infatua, Sansone, è una donna de, che non ha neanche un nome, come se non avesse proprio diritto ad averlo, è una eh, fanciulla di un villaggio di Tamna e, eh, e quindi non compare neanche, cioè, lo sappiamo soltanto dal libro dei giudici, mentre Dali eh, è la moglie che compare costantemente dal Medioevo in poi. Moglie irrequieta, eh, corrotta, brevemente, eh, riassumo, dietro una ricompensa monetaria dal suo stesso popolo, i filistei, eh, affinché eh, carpisca a Sansone il segreto dei suoi, della sua forza. E per tre volte, no? il libro ci racconta, il libro dei giudici ci racconta che per tre volte proprio serialmente gli chiede eh, perché è forte, Sansone dà delle risposte, insomma cerca di sfuggire, la terza volta gli confessa eh, che la sua forza viene da questi capelli mai tagliati e a quel punto arriva l'epilogo, quindi lui si addormenta nelle braccia di... Eh, di di Dalila e, e a quel, arriva più o meno una mano nemica, un filisteo che lo, eh, lo cattura, lo, gli tagliano i capelli, eh, lo portano nel palazzo di Gaza e, e, e arriva l'epigologo finale insomma. La perdita dei capelli è il primo atto di un percorso che porterà Sansone a diventare quindi un eroe e Dalila a uscire dal ruolo di moglie e entrare in quello del girone del tradimento. Con la rinuncia a questa chioma Sansone perde l'energia fisica, questa è un po' la lettura ehm, diciamo all'interno eh, ecclesiastica, eh, perde l'energia fisica però acquisisce questa possibilità di questo cammino verso una trasformazione e, e quindi compie in sostanza quello che fin dalla nascita era stato, gli era stato pre, predestinato, affidatogli da Cristo. Dalila è fuori da questo percorso, io ho messo semplicemente questa slide un po' di contorno eh, con le varie declinazioni senza neanche mettere la didascalia ben precisa eh? è una scelta e, e quindi mentre Sansone diventa un eroe Dalila eh, 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 diventa semplicemente una coprotagonista ed è legata soltanto a questo evento eh, de, del taglio dei capelli cosa che invece non succede ad altre ed è in negativo quindi cosa che non succede dicevo ad altre donne Giuditta, Giaele, Cleopatra e così via che invece diventano anche, eh, diciamo, protettrici o coprotettrici di una patria. Eh, in questo caso invece Dalila tradisce e basta, non tanto per spirito di patria. E, quindi dal punto di vista iconografico, salvo eh, pochissimi esempi, e uno sarà un intervento successivo con uh, il quadro di Bernardino Mei, eh, dove non c'è raffigurato propriamente il taglio dei capelli, troviamo declinato eh, sempre lo stesso tema eh, con Dalila eh, e quindi diciamo, possiamo creare delle tipologie Dalila e Sansone basta e quindi è lei che gli taglia i capelli, ho scelto questa cosa vicino eh, negli stessi anni in cui Mantegna eh, realizza la tela iniziale che abbiamo visto, ehm, in cui Dalila eh, taglia semplicemente i capelli e quindi questa è abbastanza diciamo, l'iconografia più utilizzata dagli artisti per rappresentarla. E, eh, la seconda diciamo, versione della scena eh, c'è data non soltanto da Dalila e Sansone, ma arriva un filisteo ehm, che aiuta e che anzi aiuta a tagliare in questo caso, quindi ho scelto di 
eh, così, di mostrarvi queste due tele più o meno coeve, di periodo siamo intorno agli anni 20-30 del 600, e l'altra tipologia è che non solo c'è Dali, la Sansone, ma arriva l'ancella, eh, la vecchia, vecchia ancella che assiste, che accoglie, insomma, abbastanza famosi eh, i due Stomer e Gentileschi. E, e ulteriormente ehm, invece c'è il momento ehm, in cui ehm, Sansone è catturato, quindi i filistei gli si gettano sopra, eh, Dalila è più o meno partecipe o addirittura nella tela di, Lem, di Rembrandt fugge via con eh, i capelli, le forbici e, e i soldi. E, è interessante qui ehm, la dicotomia eh, che vede interpretata da questa, mh, la fonte mh, su chi taglia i capelli ci sono degli studi americani proprio su questo ehm, eh, se Dalila o il Filisteo qui eh, rimane sempre vaga la, la, il tema perché è proprio la, eh, il libro dei giudici che non dice chi taglia veramente eh, eh, ma insomma eh, mettere la forbice come nel caso di Rubens in mano a, a, a Dalila è eh, interessante a mio avviso perché è come se sottolineasse il doppio tradimento di Dalila cioè uno vende il marito e quindi anticipazione del medesimo comportamento di Giuda mm? e, eh, e secondo è lei che lo rende inoffensivo cioè gli taglia i capelli e contemporaneamente gli toglie eh, l'essenza fisica, la forza fisica che ne caratterizzava l'esistenza quindi è una sorta di doppio tradimento quindi un soggetto mh, intriso di, di significati morali e moraleggianti, sottolinea il dominio dell'uomo sulla donna ehm, che in alcuni casi era legato appunto ad altre coppie famose questo cassone interessante di derivazione eh, petrarchessa appunto ci fa vedere Sansone e Dalila nella parte di destra eh, ma nella parte in, centrale c'è Aristotele con figli di Ocampanze che appunto è cavalcato da questo quindi mh, questa negatività di queste coppie di queste donne mh, sempre molto forti molto invadenti diciamo e, mh, il tema però va detto che è eh, solitamente diffuso su, mh, nelle abitazioni private anche in chiese ci sono temi teme allegati a Sansone molto, però molto meno e soprattutto ad esempio in Italia nel nord Italia nel sud è un tema che non, non è uscito così fortemente fuori e cosa, perché si sceglie questo tema? Um, boh, le motivazioni possono essere molte io ne ho così indicate tre finalizzate a eh, quello che poi andrò a dire ossia un tradimento dei valori quindi una scelta del soggetto perché si vuole rafforzare eh, questo un'adesione ad una causa civica o la debolezza della donna che non potendo dominare fisicamente e sentimentalmente l'uomo ehm, e quindi in questo caso Sansone eh, decide di annullarne il corpo e anche l'autostima perché per ricondurlo in prima battuta ad essere suo schiavo e poi prigioniero del suo popolo e quindi qui vorrei aprire questa sorta di ehm, così, mia lettura ehm, ancora in fieri eh, verso la letteratura, eh, ossia in età moderna la figura di Sansone, quindi di Dalila non è così, ehm, a parte eh, le, le, il testo biblico, non è così mh, diffuso, non ha avuto grande impatto nella produzione di altri testi. Nel 1671 arriva la pubblicazione invece del libro di Milton, di John Milton, Sansone agonista, e è una sorta di tragedia eh, ebraica, se vogliamo, e, eh, la pubblica nel 71, ma la gestazione ha, insomma, viene da decenni precedenti ehm, ed è una sorta di testamento dell'autore, lui muore nel 1674 e poi vedremo che c'è una sorta di sovrapposizione con questo gran dramma credo che si possa in qualche maniera parlare di, di spartiacque tra la Dalila raffigurata e la Dalila invece raccontata in letteratura ehm, la Dalila raffigurata in sostanza è sempre uguale cioè mh, va avanti all'infinito, no? cioè, io mi sono imbattuta in questa 
artista eh, statunitense che ancora nel 2008 qui nella parte bassa e, mh, e la raffigura più o meno nella stessa maniera cioè è sempre fedele a se stesso come se non riuscisse a trovare un'altra soluzione ho messo la fotografia del film di De Mille eh, del 49 uno dei colossal legati a eh, a questa figura no? e, e, appunto sempre uguale a se stesso in letteratura invece forse grazie a Milton si prende un'altra strada o perlomeno a me pare così ehm, non entro nei meriti appunto filologici letterali del testo ma eh, proprio su questa sorta di cambiamento ehm, forse più intellettuale più sottile eh, che arriva fino, fino ad oggi al contemporaneo ehm, e che eh, probabilmente lo ha traghettato eh, nel contesto anglosassone quindi c'è molta, eh, molta lettera letteratura molta, molta saggistica le che riprende il tema di Sansone e Dalila e, eh, Milton non riscatta la, la figura di Dalila, cioè non è negativa, è traditrice, eh, ma cerca invece di consegnarli, perlomeno nella lettura del Sansone Agonista esce questo, una, una sorta di anima eh, o un humanitas, se vogliamo dirlo a, a, alla latina. Eh, fino a quel momento eh, la sua tragedia, nella tragedia Dalila era stata semplicemente definita bella, perfida e vuota e così ad esempio il, un letterato di metà 500 guazzo oltre a definirla appunto a considerarla tale aggiunge anche il termine meritrice quindi è bella, avida, vuota e meritrice e Milton appunto invece gli consegna un sentimento e forse anche un senso di colpa eh, con buona pace appunto dei cristiani e fa compiere a Dalila ma anche a Sansone una sorta di autoanalisi di pre-autoanalisi e, e gli fa prendere coscienza del suo comportamento che è un comportamento dettato dall'amore ma è una sorta di amore ossessivo eh, possessivo, assassino cioè eh, eh, compie come dicevo in quel passaggio, compie una sorta di tradimento eh, per amore, per legarlo a sé e, e sì per venderlo ai filistei, ma di fatto per, renderlo, per, per rendersi indis indispensabile a se stesso. Questo Milton proprio nella sua cadenza della del dramma, della tragedia, lo, lo racconta appunto ehm, Dalila va a trovarlo in prigione, c'è una sorta di litania proprio ehm, che si addice a una tragedia co con i cori, corale, in cui lei appunto costantemente chiede perdono, chiede pietà, chiede amore e Sansone eh, gli, gli nega tutto questo. Milton scrisse, dicevo, la tragedia nel momento in cui eh, anche lui era in disgrazia in qualche maniera, passato i tempi del paradiso perduto, era senza soldi, malato, e, anche lui aveva avuto qualche moglie, la prima si era allontanata, la seconda era ritornata, ne prende altre due, eh, è cieco certo non viene rasato ma insomma ecco biograficamente sembra che si sovrappongono alcune vicende e, e quindi questo Milton consegna proprio questa sorta di dolore della coppia ma per ehm, l'eroe ovviamente sarà salvato eh, ma per Dalila invece ci restituisce una donna molto più vicina a noi quindi fragile, umana in questo, in questo amore quindi mi sembra che questo eh, come dire Facendo un salto ce la riconsegni oggi, in tempi contemporanei, dove noi forse sappiamo meglio eh, comprendere o, ehm, o comprendere non proprio, ma eh, ehm, decodificare come messaggio. Ecco, e, e mi fermo qui perché il mio intervento poi insomma, era un, um, un work in progress per eh, la parte più letteraria. Grazie. Thank you, Margherita. We finish now. Okay, from presentation. Okay, um, our next speaker is Galit Ilutz, who unfortunately cannot be with us. She's in Israel and cannot even um, connect via internet, so she has sent a video recording of her paper. Um, Galit received 
a PhD in art history to Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel in 2019, an MA in art history 2009 to 2015 at Ben Gurion again, and a BA in art history in 2004 at Tel Aviv University, Israel. Her research accomplishments um, include her B PhD dissertation, which was on Bernardino's May narrative paintings, and her master's thesis was on religious interpretation of Gresciano's frescoes, The Triumph of Aurora and Allegory of Fame in Casino Ludovisi, 2015. Today, Galit will be speaking about Samson and Delilah by Bernardino May, Carnival, Parlor Games and Female Authority. Thank you very much, Galit, for sending your um, presentation under such difficult circumstances. Um, we need to be aware of, of the situation. Okay, thank you. On December 17, 1723 in Siena, it was revealed that an estate inheritance remained undivided upon the death of Scipione Baragalli. Among the items set to be divided was this canvas, along with three other Bernardino May paintings. The assessor described the painting in the following way. A large painting framed in black of Samson with his locks of hair nailed and Pallas Athena with other naturalist figures by May. Marco Ciampolini, one of the most prominent researchers of Baroque art in Siena and specifically of Bernardino May, confirms this painting as authentically described before you. Ciampolini claims that this description refers to two different paintings, one of Samson, this painting before you, and a second never found of another painting of Pallas Athena. However, I would submit to you that the assessor's representation actually described one painting and that the figure of Delilah could also be identified as Athena. To clarify, Delilah and Athena are one and the same. There has never been two paintings, only the one you see before you. Let me explain. As I mentioned earlier, there were a total of four May paintings described here. All the paintings appear in the order in which the assessor described them in 1723, and the first description is of the painting you saw previously. All four paintings contain the subject presented here in green, the framing in orange, the size in blue, and at the end the words del May, of or by May, in red. As with any series of descriptions, the first description begins and the subsequent ones that follow must contain a transition word. In this case, outro, another, presented here in yellow. Each time the word outro appears, we see a new description of a different painting. However, before the words palata con alter figure in the first description, there's no mention of the word outro to indicate that a new painting is being described. Also, there's no reference to an additional frame and size, again, to separate between the previous painting and the next. Mind you, we're talking about a very large painting in a meeting to discuss financial gain. So you would assume that size would not only be mentioned, but emphasized. Instead, the letter E, which means and, appears to complete the description, in this case, the other naturalist figures, the old servant and Cupid with his bow. This could su suggest that in 1723, the people of Siena identified Delilah as Athena. This led me to search for images featuring Athena with Cupid. The results were immediate. You see before you the first image that I encountered in my Google search. This is an engraving of Pallas Athena as it is inscribed below the engraving. The inscription specifically mentions Pallas and Cupid. 
I took the liberty of flipping the image and placing it side by side with May's painting. The similarities are undeniable. First, notice the triangular composition. We have the powerful woman above a weakened man, and Cupid closes the composition on the top left. Next, take a look at the male figure. Both look beaten. Both grasp their attribute in their right hand with the left hand raised upward. Both male figures have the right leg slightly lifted in the air while crossing over their left leg. Notice that even the feet of both men are filthy. Next, let's look at the female figure. Both stand at a position of dominance and strength above the man. Both have their left knee raised above the man with their forearms swung over to the upper right direction. Finally, we can see other similarities between the May painting and the engraving. Both display Cupid in the upper left corner. Both pieces present weeds on the bottom right corner. In Baroque art, Delilah was often portrayed as deceitful and seductive, using her sexuality to capture and weaken Samson, like the painting you see here. However, at that time, May seemed to present a new perspective, Delilah as Athena, a smart, discreet, noble, and courageous woman who managed to overpower Samson because of those qualities and not because of her sexuality. Such ideas would only appear 400 years later when the feminist biblical scholar Lillian Klein would present her similar to May. This May painting was the first instance where, in art, Delilah is not presented as being able to overtake Samson by luring him in a sexual way, rather as a powerful woman who has the physical strength to afflict Samson, as written in the Bible. However, there is a common element to explore in the painting, and that is the language games that appear therein. So, in order to understand these language games within the painting, let me put it in context for you. In the mid-1500s, Siena, a once flourishing republic city, was sold to its sworn enemy, Florence making the ruling aristocrats of Siena powerless. Under their new roles, the aristocrats sought to redefine themselves and give new meaning to their lives through the cultural activities in the academies. One of the academies that flourished in Siena was the Academia degli Intronati. It included the full participation of women and centered around intellectual talent, rhetorical eloquence, and new cultural practices such as theater and language games. In fact, during this time, Girolamo Baragalli, a member of the Intronati Academy, published his book, Dialogo de Giochi, which was a guide for the parlor games of Siena. The book quotes anecdotes from 130 games as they were actually played. One game that was played during that time, and later during the Carnival of 1708, was the Amazons game, which depicted a battle between a group of female warriors against a group of young men. One by one, a man and a woman would step forward. The man would declare which weapon he would use to conquer the woman, and then the woman would describe her defense. So, why was Delilah described as Athena Palace in our painting? Well, it seems that the image before you may present a language game called the Amazon's game in her fight against Samson. I mean, we know that in art, the Amazons were sometimes depicted as warrior goddesses like Athena or Artemis. So what are the hints that led me to believe that a language game is hidden in this painting? Let's take a look. This image presents the first instance of a play on language. Notice that Cupid is pointing his index finger to his tongue, the source of language. As we know, the tongue is the organ of speech. In addition, the word lingua means language in both Latin and Italian. 
With his other hand, Cupid is pointing to Delilah, who is gazing at the jawbone of the donkey that is in Samson's grip. So why choose Samson as the beaten figure in the painting? Well, in the biblical perspective, Samson was known as a master of language. Samson used puns to express meaning in poetry after his victory in Ramat Lechi with the jawbone. Lechi in Hebrew, by the way, means jawbone, and he named that place. So let's take a look at an instance of poetry. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Samson used puns to express meaning in riddles. Samson told his famous riddle to his guests during his wedding feast, which shows his power of language. Let's take a look. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Samson used puns to express meaning in phrases. Even one of his phrases to Philistines after they had interrogated his wife shows his remarkable way with words. So let's take a look at the example. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. The carnival celebrations were a place where many of these language games were played. The language games featured in Girolamo Barogali's book were usually played at evening parties during the carnival. Notice in the painting that while the artist depicted the figures in antique clothing appropriate to the period, the presence of the carnival mask is an anachronistic act. After all, the carnival took place in a different place in time from the biblical story. The wanderer on the right of the painting informs the viewer that he entered one of the carnival celebrations in Siena, hosted by a noble family. So what is the pun here? But first, let's talk about emblems. Emblems served as a social game for an exclusive group of academy members who engaged in discussions about their essence. The emblem connects text, a motto, and an image, pittura and help to forge a connection between artists. In a book of animal emblems called Mondo Symbolico, printed in Milan in 1653, we can see the connection between Samson and the lion. In the book, there is a lion depicted as subdued and bound, and above it, a sign reads, the honor of the conquered elevates the glory of the victor. This is meant to illustrate the glory of Delilah as the victor who conquered the heroic Samson. So we can infer that the lion represents Samson and he represents the lion. There's more. There are two allegories hidden in the paintings and appearing in Cesare Ripa's book, Iconologia, where the first allegory appears under generosita, the feminine version of the noun. According to Ripa, Generosity portrays a young and beautiful woman emphasizing the virtues of courage and generosity. In her right hand, she holds pearls and necklaces with precious stones, and her sleeve is absent while the sleeve of her left arm hangs loose. The allegory of generosity places her left hand on the head of a lion, symbolizing courage and pride. Now let's look at the figure of Delilah. On her left hand, she holds pearls and necklaces with ruby stones. Also, notice that Delilah's necklace arm is without a sleeve, unlike the other arm as she stands above Samson, in other words, the lion. The second allegory also appears in Ripa's book, where the allegory appears under Generoso the masculine version of the noun. Here we can see a man defeating a lion, his right hand encased in armor, while the rest of his body is exposed as he's pulling the lion's tongue. Over his shoulders, a shawl is draped as he turns his head to the right. We can observe the similarity between the two, Delilah and Generoso. Both of them bent their left leg and turned their heads to the right, with the upper part of their bodies wrapped in a robe. Similarly, both figures tower over a defeated lion, with Samson being the emblem of the defeated lion. 
The lines that appear before you represent Samson and Delilah. The horizontal line is Samson, who represents Generoso, while the vertical line is Delilah, who represents Generosita. Let's go back to the carnival of the Amazon Games of the noble family in Siena. The man initially stands before the woman, declaring that he will capture her with just the armor of Generoso. However, the woman responds that she will defend herself with Generosita, which equals to Generoso plus Sita, which means located or above. And so Generosita stands above Generoso as the victor. So, was it merely word games which inspired the commission of such a colossal painting? A brief description from the period implied that the Academia del Assicurate was established spontaneously during a parlor game. So, I submit to you that perhaps in one of the game nights of the Carnival of 1655, hosted by Niccolo Gori, a woman defeated a man and allowed for the foundation of the first academy of women in Italy, and probably the first in Europe. I think you'll all agree, very um, uh, thought-provoking presentation, especially in the times that we're in. Um, I think we should... We have one more speaker, Facciamo adesso dopo, a break first. Okay, we'll have a coffee break and the time is 10.30, so we meet back here just after 11. We can... Oh, I need to uh, indicate that Elisa Staffarini's paper will be presented this afternoon. So... Greta, after the break, then lunch, question and answers at lunch, and then in the afternoon we have Consuelo, um, Elisa Staferini, and Patricia Rocco, then closing remarks by Vera, Professor Ressa Vera Fortunati. Thank you very much for your attention.
Can you hear me?
Good uh, morning. Welcome to the last paper of our morning session. We have Margaret Barnes, uh, known as Greta, who is currently pursuing an MA in Art History at the University of Washington. Her research concentrates on religious paintings in Counter-Reformation Italy, specifically dealing with works painted by women artists, as well as how women were represented in religious imagery of the time. She recently completed her bachelor's thesis at the University of Pittsburgh, which deals with the Marian paintings of Artemisia Gentileschi, and she, uh, she presented part of this thesis at last year's um, edition of AWAC. During her undergraduate career, she's won various awards and fellowships and is continually working to develop a digital archive for documents of the Egypt collection at Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And Greta will talk to us about, she will step on thy head, Lucrina Fetti, St. Margaret as a conqueror of sin. Thank you, Margaret, or Greta, I should say. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> Alrighty, so thank you. It's nice to be able to join everyone virtually. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Modesti and Dr. Lola Brigida for um, organizing and allowing me to present to you all today. Alrighty. <clears throat> Again, the devil, still trying to deceive Margaret, changed himself to a man. She saw him and resorted to prayer. And when she rose, the devil approached, took her hand and said, let all you've done be enough for you and just let me be. But she grabbed him by the head, pushed him to the ground, planted her right foot on his head and said, lie last, proud demon, at the foot of a woman. This passage is an excerpt from the life of St. Margaret of Antioch as recorded in the Golden Legend. In this passage, Margaret faces a demon masquerading as a man as he begs for her mercy. At only 15 years old, the young girl disregards him, instead wrestling him to the ground, subduing Satan. This moment of victory is reflected in a work by artist Lucrina Fetti, painted in 1619. In this painting, St. Margaret stands in the center of the canvas, features of a landscape spotted behind her. Clad in an orange and green dress and a red sash, her left foot peeks out from the hem of her dress, standing on the neck of a dead dragon. The dragon is contorted beneath her feet, blood seeping out of a slit in its neck, and its serpentine tail protrudes on the left of the saint, having yet to fall in defeat. Margaret holds a wooden cross in one hand, her head upturned to the sky. Her stance is one of victory, the painting depicting a triumphant woman standing over her fallen foe. The painting itself was originally located in the convent of St. Ursula in Mantua. At this time, the Council of Trent had recently enforced cloistering on all religious life, with emphasis on the supervision of women, both lay and religious. The convent of St. Ursula stands out as a unique entity in these times. It was founded by Duchess Margarita Gonzaga, who also inhabited its walls, and the convent eventually became what historians have dubbed as the quasi-court of the Duchess. This meant that there was a constant stream of visitors in the convent, including men who were high-ranking in both the hierarchy of both Europe and the church. In the St. Margaret, Lucrina Fetti uses the purity and strength of its subject to mirror the biblical conquering of sin by the Virgin Mary, prophesied in the book of Genesis. The utilization of this parallel corresponds with its placement in the convent of St. Ursula, as the canvas presents a challenge to the post-Tridentine attitudes towards women. The demonstration of Margaret's physical and spiritual resilience, as seen by such a diversified audience, is more than the mere story of a saint. It is the image of a warring and victorious woman, and a symbol which reflects on the strength of the entire gender. Nun and artist Lucrina Fetti was born as Giustina Fetti in Rome, and was the sister of Domenico Fetti. In 1614, Domenico was invited to become the court painter of Duke Fernando Gonzaga of Mantua. Following this invitation, Lucrina and her family moved to Mantua. Not long after, she entered the convent of St. Ursula, 
her spiritual dowry having been paid for by the Duke. As a sister in the convent, she worked as an artist for Margarita Gonzaga painting works for the decoration of the convent. She also painted many portraits of the Duchess and the other noble woman who would have come to inhabit the walls of this convent. It is here that Lucrina would paint the image of St. Margaret, likely to believe to have been hung in the chambers of Margarita. Its subject, Margaret of Antioch, was a saint and virgin martyr of the early church. An emphasis of saintly piety, including collections of relics and increased devotional art, led her cult to grow in prominence from the Middle Ages to the period. Certainly, this saint was also present due to her status as the patron saint of founder Margarita Gonzaga. The legends of St. Margaret are vast, particularly due to her shared heritage with her Greek counterpart, Marina. While the earliest known version of the legend was in Greek, Latin versions of the legend emerged beginning in the 8th century. For the work of Lucrina Feti, the most prominent written version of the life of St. Margaret was likely the one in the Golden Legend, a compiled volume detailing the lives of many saints. The Golden Legend stands out as a book whose popularity equaled, or in some cases succeeded, that of the Bible in early modern Italy. While her legends may differ slightly, the saint's narrative remains largely the same. Margaret was born in Antioch, the daughter of a pagan Roman official, Theodosius. She was raised by her nurse who converted the young girl to Christianity. At the age of 15, she is seen by a Roman official named Olibris, who demands to have her as his wife, or, is, or if she is a slave, his concubine. Margaret refuses, having consecrated herself to Christ. Brought before Olibris, she defends her faith, and he subsequently throws her in prison. She is tortured repeatedly before being martyred, but not before she converts over 500 witnesses through her defense of her faith. The aspect of her legend most depicted occurs during her imprisonment, when Margaret prays to God to be able to see the evil which she is facing. Immediately, a dragon appears within her cell. Stories of Margaret's conquering differ, as early legends suggest that the dragon swallowed her whole before she triumphantly emerged from its stomach. The Golden Legend, however, states that the dragon merely disappeared after Margaret made the sign of the cross. Margaret's encounter with the demon in the form of a dragon is perhaps the most essential aspect of her visual iconography. The dragon stands as her identifier in the visual arts, whether it remains merely snarling next to her or she is seen actively conquering this evil. The popularity of the saint is such that there were two other works of the saint in Mantua at this time, credited as possible inspirations for Lucrina. Ludovico Caracci's The Martyrdom of St. Margaret and Antonio Maria Viani's St. Margaret and St. Ursula in Glory with the Trinity. Ludovico Caracci's Martyrdom hangs in the church of San Marito in Mantua. In this painting, we see St. Margaret on an elevated platform alongside her executioner. The audience below observe in horror, passivity, or some in gross satisfaction. Margaret kneels above, leaning towards the left of the canvas, seeking to escape the sword of her executioner, whose arm is tensed, preparing to deliver the killing blow. A dragon lays on the other side of the executioner, its lolling head indicating its death. The picture creates an interesting juxtaposition of Margaret's conquering and her own defeat. The dead dragon serves to represent the conquering of evil, yet she kneels, her eyes wide in fear and uncertainty preparing for her own death. The event which Karachi is depicting has no overlap in the timeline of any legend with the presence or conquering of the dragon. The dragon instead is presented as a way of identifying the young martyr as Saint Margaret. The landscape in which we see the saint changes in Viani's work as she kneels among the clouds, Saint Ursula standing behind her. Margaret has her hands folded in front of her chest as she bows towards the figures on the right side of the canvas. Among this painting of glory, the figures enthroned among the clouds and the angels and heavenly beings crowding in the foreground, there is a menacing dragon laying alongside the saint, examining the crowd of worshippers and snarling. The extreme contrast with the dragon reflects in the narrative depicted in both Karachi and Viani's works cements it as an almost mandatory iconographic trait of the saint. 
The works of Caracci and Viani also certainly attest to the widespread presence of images of Saint at the time, but iconographically, they do not align with Lucrina's depiction. Instead of featuring Saint Margaret in a larger composition, Lucrina Fetti's work depicts the saint autonomously. In this work, she stands tall. She does not kneel for her execution, nor a heavenly presentation. Saint Margaret is triumphant. Her head raises to the sky, acknowledging that her strength comes from God, the cross in her right hand reinforcing her devotion. While the dragon represents Margaret's first encounter with the demon, her stance reflects her conquering during her second encounter when Margaret wrestles the demon, now a man, to the ground, standing on its neck. As she stands on the struggling man, she interrogates him, demanding to know the ways of the devil when tempting men. Lucrina's visual combination of the separate attacks represents the saint's conquering in a new light, as her stance mirrors another visual tradition of the conquering of Satan, as prophesied in the book of Genesis. The prophecy in Genesis, also referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, discusses the future of humanity after the fall of Adam and Eve. It is a promise from God that after expelling Adam and Eve from the garden following their disobedience, he will send his son through the Virgin Mary to conquer over sin and death. Quote, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed in her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait, thou shalt lie wait for her and heal. Unquote. The she of the prophecy is believed by the Catholic Church to be a representation of the Virgin Mary, who is often referred to as the second or new Eve. This prophecy is interpreted as Mary's eventual conquering of Satan through the birth of her son and his triumph against sin and death. References to this passage frequently show in paintings of the Virgin Mary, particularly during the Counter-Reformation when Mary's role in salvation was debated by both the Catholic Church and Protestants alike. In paintings from artists such as Caravaggio and Peter Paul Rubens, Mary is seen stepping on a snake, a visual tradition which directly references her role in salvation. It was not unusual for the serpent to be depicted as a lizard or dragon-like creature either, and Lucrina's painting imitates this in the upright tale of the deceased dragon, whose curves reflect that of a serpent. This connection of the Proto-Evangelium within the legend of St. Margaret has also been made by scholars who note parallel phrasing in the Latin legends of the episode where she steps on the demon, specifically citing Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Parallels of St. Margaret and the Virgin Mary are also noted, with the legend describing a dove appearing during, from heaven during her martyrdom, attesting that she is, quote, blessed among women, a parallel to Luke 1, when the angel visits the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary was the exemplary exception to all believed faults of women during the Counter-Reformation, an unreachable standard that holy women were expected to strive for. Yet Lucrina's depiction of Margaret brings Mary's most essential role in salvation and the conquering of sin as something which all women can achieve, as all humans could potentially become saints. Lucrina Fetzi's statement of the power of women, both spiritually and physically, was a pointed response to the changing attitudes towards women, laying religious during the Counter-Reformation. The Renaissance period had fostered progress regarding the spiritual learning and education of women. The translation of scripture into the vernacular created roots of personal devotion and led to the formation of spiritual groups such as the Illuminists, which would often be led by women. While the luxury of education was still largely reserved for the wealthy and clergy, women's spirituality became increasingly personal and independent. Convent life in the Renaissance was also expansive, with each order holding varying missions, many of those including education of their members and girls of all classes. New orders such as the Ursulines formed, which created a unique environment of spirituality for religious lay women, as the members of these orders followed many of the same missions of convent life while rejecting the habit and formal definition of a convent. The Council of Trent, however, quickly brought an end to these traditions. By designating the Latin Vulgate as the only canonical version of the Bible and denouncing groups such as the Illuminist as heretical, women became increasingly cut off from roots of personal devotion. With these changes came a stronger reinforcement of the quote, wife or the wall perspective regarding women's roles, 
a previously existing ideal rooted in the belief of women's innate fallibility. This led to the reinforcement of the necessity for male supervision, either through the husband's control of their wives or mandated cloistering of all religious orders, each to be closely supervised by a bishop. While the forced cloistering of many religious orders was met with resistance and in many ways altogether disregarded, the intent and reasoning behind these strictures bears thought. In their session reports, the Council of Trent specifies their rulings as ones which were done under the belief that women were inherently susceptible to sin and required close supervision in order to resist the prey, quote, the prey and robbery of wicked men and other evil outrages, unquote. They further expand by saying that the supervising bishops were required to hear monthly confessions of the nuns in order for them to, quote, fortify and guard themselves for the vanquishing and subduing of all assaults of the devil, unquote. It is important to note that this level of supervision was specified to nuns, not male religious, who operated independently within their own monasteries. The decree of this weakness of the female sex holds its roots in scripture itself, as they were believed to have been inherently flawed from the beginning of creation. Nearly every church father after Augustine blamed Eve for the fall of humanity, as she was the first to give in to the devil's temptation and in turn became a temptress for men as well. The events of Genesis created a long lasting belief of the inferiority of women, particularly as it relates to their ability to resist sin and temptation. Writings of the early church from authors such as Tertullian denounce women as followers of Eve. Quote, do you not know that you are Eve? You are the devil's gateway. How easily you destroyed man, the image of God, unquote. Even in the writings of Ignatius of Loyola in the later 16th century, there was a continued parallel of evil with womanhood. Quote, the enemy conducts himself as a woman. He is a weakling before a show of strength and a tyrant if he has his way, unquote. Not only were women considered inferior, but this belief ultimately traces back to Genesis and the sins of Eve, a tradition which makes the pointed response of Lucrina St. Margaret highly specific. In order to fully understand the importance of the painting, we must consider the audience and placement of the image. As previously mentioned, the convent of St. Ursula was a unique political and spiritual entity in Mantua, often defined by scholars as serving the role of the convent and the all-female court of Duchess Margarita Gonzaga. For this creation, and despite the rules of Trent, Margarita had petitioned and negotiated with the Pope to allow herself and several of her ladies in waiting and relatives to live in the convent without taking the veil. In addition, she worked to limit the regulatory power of the bishops, while also allowing her brother, the Duke, foreign dignitaries, fellow royalty and church officials to visit her in her chambers within the convent in order to conduct her business. In the chambers of Margarita Gonzaga, primary source documents from the later 18th century identify images such as Matilda of Canossa alongside over 20 unnamed paintings. An image of St. Margaret alongside figures such as Matilda, a woman of legendary political influence and conquests, further emphasize the prominence of this image, not as one solely of piety, but also of female victory. The activities of Margarita Gonzaga and the nuns within the convent overlapped frequently, most often in the form of spiritual life and education. Instead of the paintings of St. Margaret serving an audience solely of the convent's inhabitants, its audience likely overlapped to include both uh, men and women, who would have held the image as something to aspire to, but in contrast to images of the Virgin, something which they could achieve. The Duchess's visitors, however, would have seen the painting of Margaret alongside others such as Matilda and understood the exceptionalism of this saint, an argument towards the beliefs of the female gender in this time of turmoil. It is in this way that Lucrina Fetti St. Margaret uses the images of the Proto-Evangelium to demonstrate to the male authorities of Italy and Europe the true strength of women and their ability to wage war and conquer, both physically and spiritually. In conclusion, the painting of St. Margaret by Lucrina Fetti represents a pointed political and spiritual argument against the prevailing post-Tridentine ideals of women's seclusion and piety. The historical context of the Council of Trent's strict enforcement of cloistering and the unique status of the convent as the quasi-court for Margarita Gonzaga sets the stage for this powerful portrayal of St. Margaret. 
By comparing the saint's purity and strength with the biblical vir- narrative of the Virgin Mary conquering sin, as seen in Genesis, the painting not only tells the story of a saint, but it also serves as a symbol of the resilience and strength of women. It challenges the traditional expectations placed on women in that era and, prevents a vi- and presents a vivid image of a warring and victorious woman, transcending the limitations imposed by society. Lucrina Fetzi's artwork thus becomes a testament to the enduring strength and resilience of the female gender, offering a unique and inspirational perspective that defies the norms of its time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greta, for that uh, very interesting reading of, of Lucrina Fetti, St. Margaret, as, female, as an image of female victory and strength. Um, now, cosa facciamo adesso? Ah, fai te per te. Okay. I'd like to welcome Dr. Consuelo Lolo Brigida who will talk to us about the palace in which this conference is held, the Palazzo Orsini Taverna Gabrielli, Power, Art and Education. Thank you, Consuela. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adelina. And even to follow up so <clears throat> to some of your requests, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the palace, uh, <clears throat> which hosts our uh, institution has been housing our institution actually since 20, uh, 2012. So for <clears throat> 11 years now. And uh, in the palace, which in a, in, in a sense is um, uh, connected to some <clears throat> uh, powerful uh, women uh, who had um, shaped uh, either uh, its uh, um, architectural and historical um, future in either um, part of the <clears throat> a educational um, and pedagogical um, history of it, as we will see. First of all, it is Palazzo Orsini Taverna Gabrielli. So the Orsini were the first owners, landlords, uh, who <clears throat> are... Uh, we're founding probably the first um, nucleus of the palace um, around 11, uh, 1100, if not earlier. In Taverna, we uh, succeeded the Orsini, as we will see, in the 1600. And last uh, one in the line, in, chronolog- in chronological line, um, is the Gabrielli family, uh, who acquired uh, via... <coughs> uh, marriage uh, the the palace and many estates uh, all over uh, the Lazio region uh, at the end of the 1800s they are still the actual owners of um, of the building well <clears throat> this is a, um, practically the extension of um, of the palace uh, as you can see, it is wider than probably we can imagine just being here and walking through uh, the main gates and crossing over the garden and the courtyard of the palace, and which uh, it was uh, in the, um, during the Middle Ages. Uh, Mm, the uh, area was completely uh, surrounded and protected by thick walls. And we can see, I don't know if this works, or at least I'm able to make it working. Uh, no, which is the pointing, Fabio? Which one? The ultimo. Okay. Uh, uh, here. This part, this is Via de Coronari, here you can see also because of, you know, the irregular structure of the city walls, uh, that that's the part where you can still see, uh, get an hint uh, of uh, the former city walls of the, um, this area. This is again what I've told already, so 2062, which is the, um, the very time, the very year when, you know, the palace was founded by the Orsini till 1688, and then 1888 till now, the Taverna family, who is a family from uh, Milan. Uh, well, this is uh, <clears throat> again a, a 
3D elevation of, uh, of the area, which is uh, surrounded by uh, important uh, um, streets. Uh, the one on the upper left edge, Via di Monte Giordano, which is the street uh, where the main gate uh, is uh, located, uh, was named after the Giordano Orsini, one of the main protagonists of the history of the palace, but the whole history of the Orsini, Orsini family. Then you can see Vicolo Domizio on the just clockwise. Um, Vicolo Domizio, where you can see from the structures uh, these uh, medieval uh, characteristics of it. And then Via de Coronari, <coughs> Via de Coronari, Coronari uh, Okay, Via de Coronari, which is. Hmm. Okay. The main uh, axis, um, uh, the one horizontal, um, okay, uh, in which is, uh, according to some scholars, the Decumano Maximus of the ancient city of Rome. It is not really, uh, they are not all completely. Uh, agree on this point uh, because, as we know, you know, the siege of Rome was founded by the Palatine and the Roman Forum as a meeting place uh, and for military and political reasons. And so the Romans had their uh, city plans must read and conceive the, um, after the foundation of Rome, that is to say around 300, 400 and 300 BCE, when they started expanding the city towards the Campo Marzio, the fields of Mars, which is, uh, you know, the Rione or the neighborhood of this, this district we border with. Uh, and that's why for some scholars, uh, probably Via de Coronari, which uh, as a matter of fact connects the very north of the city center of Rome to <coughs> Ponte Elio, Ponte Bridge, Bridge um, uh, Ponte uh, Sant'Angelo, Sant'Angelo Bridge nowadays, it was and it is a very important, has been <coughs> serving the, um, the pedestrian traffic uh, of Rome at least uh, um, since 300 BCE. And that's, uh, and that's why the Orsini, after the fall of the Roman, uh, after the fall of Roman Empire and the taking over of the church, decided to have a kind of um, uphold uh, constructed nearby the Via de Coronari, which evidently is uh, a medieval <clears throat> uh, tag name of the city Coronari, where the um, rosary makers, because you know there was plenty of stores and the artisans who sold rosaries of any kind so to the pilgrims. They were trying to get St. Peter's from the north of Rome. So Coronari uh, is named after them. Um, uh, by the way, so because it was very close to the Vatican City, nowadays back to the, to the St. Peter's Basilica and to Castel Sant'Angelo, the Orsini, uh, who was, as we will see, a very powerful family at the beginning as a military force and later on as a financial and economical power, they decided to have right close to it that uphold in their resi residence, uh, both to control the entrance into the city from Via de Coronari and to put an eye over the Basilica of St. Peter's and therefore the, um, uh, the Vatican. <clears throat> well, uh, well, this is a just a little bit digression about this idea of palace because according to, no, to, uh, to our idea of palace, the, the palace is a, a square, at least a rectangular um, building. Uh, uh, was uh, <coughs> characteristics in modern times were um, designed by Alberti no? in his treatise about the architecture and the architecture. And Palazzo Ruccellai is the handbook uh, or the perfect or kind of perfect representation or realization of the ideal idea of. Um, of a palace. So just looking at the Palazzo Ruccellai in Florence, 1446, 1451, we can see uh, that there are evident 
uh, where it, this is Palazzo Farnese, which is the, the so-called dice of the Renaissance, because it's really perfectly matching uh, <clears throat> the idealistic suggestions Alberti gives in his, uh, in his book. But Palazzo, where is it? Okay, Palazzo Taverna, as you can see, is anything but uh, a, a sort of combination <clears throat> of different uh, buildings uh, which preexisted the idea and the birth of the Renaissance palace. Because it was, as I told you, uh, this uh, was created uh, <clears throat> as a military fortress. Um, using uh, <clears throat> more likely um, some Roman structures, um, and there are, <clears throat> for instance, uh, we will see in some slides, um, Piranesi, Giovan Battista Piranesi, in his description of Rome, states and uh, designs uh, the ancient city of Rome, so locating right underneath um, the Palazzo Taverna, the ruins of a Roman amphitheater, amphitheater the amphitheater of Statilio Taurus. And uh, I don't know if you have noticed, just walking through the courtyard that the floor level is not flattish but it is a li little bit uh, concave and this kind of have sort of as we call them in Rome the hills of Rome I mean kind of height you know and the so differences in the geological um, uh, shape of um, uh, of the territory uh, made Piranesi think uh, um, just through the elaboration of the ancient sources that probably the amphitheater of Statilio Taurus which had to be uh, older than the amphitheater the Colosseum, the Flavian Amphitheater, could be underground here. That's a question mark, an hypothesis, very fascinating one, but it's just an hypothesis. It's a matter of fact, though, that the Orsini had taken over another important Roman building before this one, which was the Teatro di Marcello, Marcello's Theater. So it was one of their peculiarity to <clears throat> take over and use uh, the Roman important buildings uh, <clears throat> to create the premises of their um, uh, expansions in terms of uh, territorial control. Uh, well, these are other examples again of um, of palaces. This is Palazzo Medici. <clears throat> this is Leon Battista Alberti <clears throat> portrait Masaccio and Brunelleschi. Palazzo, uh, Palazzo Farnese, <clears throat> that's the design by Antonio, Antonio da Sangallo. Uh, these are some etchings uh, uh, of um, Palazzo Farnese, uh, has designed by Antonio da Sangallo the Younger, and the changes done by Michelangelo after 15. Uh, uh, 1534, <clears throat> and that is, uh, you know, the reason why we call it Palazzo because it is related to the again the ancient Roman times, the Palatino, the palace, so the ancient uh, settlement of Rome, where both the kings and the emperors uh, have their dwellings and their palaces and their um, uh, official uh, residences. <clears throat> and here we go. This is the etching uh, the, by Giovanni Battista Piranesi, uh, Statilio Staus Theater, and dating back uh, to, I mean, Piranesi printed out in 1762, uh, uh, which is, uh, I mean, as you know very well, and so Piranesi was kind of interpreting uh, um, and giving it to the Roman um, uh, to the Roman buildings and Roman uh, monuments is on uh, uh, idea he was envisioning rather than being uh, um, stuck on the as a matter of fact, because it was not yet in discipline, by the way, but in young disciplines, the archaeological evidences. Uh, but this is how Piranesi had um, uh, thought the theater <clears throat> could it be. And here it is how, I mean, the, uh, let's go into other uh, evidences. This is uh, <clears throat> uh, an important. Uh, uh, map uh, of uh, uh, of Rome, uh, dating to the um, 
to the half of the 14 uh, of the 1400 uh, I uh, well I didn't upload it uh, wrongly but it is how the the city was seen back then so you can see that the Vatican is right on on the right hand side should be uh, all the way around and the little red circle, it is uh, how the palazzo looked like, uh, um, at least in, 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 until the middle of the 1400, if not uh, a little bit uh, uh, later. Um, there was a, a church, you see Giordano, M. Giordano. This is the map of Rome by Pietro del Massaio from 1463, uh, where you can distinctly see the Campus, uh, campus Floris, Campo de Fiori, so the, the square. You can see St. Agnes, the Church of St. Agnes, and you can see the Domitian um, uh, Stadium, Piazza Navona, later on. And the, again, the Palazzo Monte Giordano with the, the, the upright the tower and fortress, which was probably uh, hosting this <coughs> gone church of Santa Maria in Monticello. So again, the uh, toponymous Monticello recalls this idea of something up above, something else. In the monte, monte it's uh, something high, and you can see the river mm, down the the, the, the red uh, bold the, the black um, bold line. Pirro Ligorio, fifteen uh, fifty two, uh, describes uh, <laughs> the the palazzo as it is pretty pretty much looks like still nowadays. Uh, you can see Monte Giordani uh, right in the center of the courtyard. Um, we again can see the, the, the medieval structure, which is the, the one on the um, uh, for uh, foreground, and um, and other different buildings. Uh, this was a <clears throat> really an, a household where uh, some thousand people lived uh, at once. Um, the, <clears throat> the main line of the family, plus the cadets one, and plus all the servants, and it included the stables, uh, and um, uh, yes, included the stables and warehouses. So it was really uh, called the island of the Orsini, uh, and that was. Uh, it made uh, it was enlarged. Even after 1552, uh, <laughs> we can see it better. Five years later, Fabio Licinio, in his map of Rome, uh, makes uh, uh, another, gives us another perspective uh, of the palace. So, if we made uh, a comparison between this one, 1552, 1557, you can see there have been added some interesting details, including. <coughs> This was a monumental staircase which led up to the main gate of the palace. And that was probably the, the, the visual sources. Uh, Piranesi started from uh, to get the idea of uh, to think that underground that there were still the ruins of the amphitheaters of Statilio Tauro. <clears throat> the Ursini had a in great extension uh, of uh, lands, as I told you, even outside the city, um, the city of Rome. And this is the beautiful castle in Bracciano, the Orsini uh, castle in, in Bracciano. <clears throat> uh, then the family uh, had different. Uh, Lines. There was a line also in Pitigliano, in the south of, uh, in the south of um, of Tuscany, in the in the in the Maremma. Uh, this is Orsini di Pitigliano, Orsini di Monte Rotondo. So they were more than household. They were kind of half <laughs> parts. They really were forming uh, the 
over the 50% of the actual uh, people of the state of the church and the patrimony of St. P- Peter. Well, this is pretty much the line of communications, the main street and line of communication during the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, Orsini had and have some possessions in the very south of Italy, in the Puglia, in the hill. They had and have possessions in Spain, either north and south of Spain, as well as in some region in France. So because of, through their um, through matrimonial uh, alliances, they were able to to create these uh, incredible networks of um, connections and power. Mm, that's the Via Francigena. Okay, uh, here you can see. I told you that there was this big family, you know, the, the 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 primary line and the cadets. So according to the different colors, so the red and the green and the purple, uh, you can see who owned what. So they really owned the different sections, uh, but they all lived inside the building. Uh, The the little oval oval, uh, line you see on the left of the screen, it is uh, the fountain. It's, uh, of course, back then it was not the fountain, it was the well. It was transformed into a fountain by the Gabrielli. Well, in this, in this, this, uh, now let's go into the, patronage and matronage of of the palace uh, um, because this palace gave birth so uh, more 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 correctly the birth of some of the most important and influential protagonists of the history of Italy first of all here we can see this um, uh, <clears throat> little um, uh, quote from uh, Dante <clears throat> infer the divine comedy veramente fui figlio dell'orsa cupido si per avanzar gli orsatti che sull'aver e qui me misi in borsa uh, so he is, is talking of whom he's talking of Nicholas the third from the, Orf- of the Orsini family uh, who reigned uh, over the state uh, over the church of Rome from 1277 and 1280 uh, only um, it's very short lasting pontiff just three years but as it would have been happened later on with Pope Sistus V who um, made you know the, the most important probably ever master plan city master plan of Rome he made it just in five years um, and, and we, we know that Sistus, Pope Sistus started thinking out to the master plan before getting elected Pope um, as Pope Nicholas so <clears throat> This Orsini had in his mind the idea of re, um, re, re uh, not to reconstruct, but to um, make some important uh, changings and restoration works uh, all over the city of Rome. Here we can see him getting in front of, uh, uh, well, actually, he is decided by St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, and he, he is looking at towards Christ, sitting on a throne in a beautiful Santa Santorum chapel uh, in the Lateran. <clears throat> and what he is holding he is the model of of the chapel, which was considered that they still and now it's ca- called the Sistine Chapel of the of the Middle Ages because it was the place where uh, next to it there were. <clears throat> Uh, done the, uh, the conclaves, uh, and it was uh, where the, the place where the relics of mothers, including Peter and Paul, had been preserving for thousands of years until the beginning of the 19, of the 1900. But the most important, um, I mean, one of the most important interesting things about this painting and the cycle, the frescoes, which represents the motherdom of Peter and Paul, the motherdom of Stephen and Lawrence, and, and, and the history of Saint Nicholas. So <clears throat> the saint uh, the Pope was named after, were done by this so-called master of the Santa Santorum, right at the time of Nicholas, so 1277, 1280, if probably also a few years after his death, they continued a few years after his death. Uh, other ones uh, uh, are thinking of the Giotto, 
you are thinking of the a young Giotto coming to Rome and starting uh, elaborating uh, the, the uh, well, proposing, providing Pope Nicholas new hints of a new language, which was matching with the political idea of Nicholas, who came from this very important um, family. Mm, this is again the plan of the ground floor and the plan <clears throat> of the piano nobile, the piano nobile, the first the first floor. This is again 1577, the palace in the Peracle Freri plan of Rome. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, what is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, mm, 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 mm. Uh, 1593 Magis map with the, um, the detail uh, more um, with some, the, the details are described in um, differently so it's really an attention to uh, the functions and the design of it where we can see the staircase uh, which was located along via the coronari because again in the middle ages when they take over they took over and they started the construction of their palace they want to face towards the vatican they didn't want to face towards the other side of rome because that was the main um, uh, idea, yeah. Uh, this is a 1625. You can see again, you know, the the entrance. Well, this is the the fountain. I don't know if you have noticed the ramping bear entering the palace right in front of it. Uh, <clears throat> And well, this is uh, something. Uh, this, uh, anytime I talk of this, uh, I have really sense of how the, the limits we are. Because um, in the 1527, uh, the palace was the, one of the main targets of the uh, Germans. They were the Lanzikinek. These words uh, gets me crazy at all the times in, in German and in English. In Italian, it's Lanzikinek. Mm, and they entered the city, and though the city was under the threat and it was um, sacked for almost nine months. And among the targets they, um, they had, there was, of course, the Palazzo Taverna, Palazzo Orsini, the Vatican, um, and some concessions of the Orsini on the southeast. Uh, of Rome. This, the, the palace was assaulted, was uh, sacked, and was also burnt. And uh, the burning <clears throat> made the destruction of the, of course, of the medieval and Renaissance side of it, which is the parts, uh, the, the, the the section uh, just in front of on, um, in front of the Piazza Monte Giordano or Piazza dell'Orologio at Corso Vittorio, and they um, and during the burning it was destroyed. The one of the most important Renaissance cycle <clears throat> present in Rome. Uh, which was uh, done by uh, Masolino da Padincale. Uh, fortunately, a few <coughs> decades before, the palace was uh, got a visit of Berta Emily de Heich, uh, from Amsterdam, who designed the Cockerel Chronicle and uh, practically um, reproducing uh, uh, in different, as you can see, in independent uh, figures, uh, the cycle of the um, illustrious men which occupied the side uh, which is right uh, in front of our, in the entrance of our institution, what we call it now the Baroque wing of the palace, which was the Renaissance wing uh, um, before. Um, and that is the only uh, visual uh, records we have of uh, of the cycle. Um, <clears throat> here we are. Other example. I mean, other drawings. You can see the the, the Monte Jordan up there. Uh, and well, and that cycle doesn't carry the matronage of this woman. But this woman is uh, the 
that is the environment where Clary Giorsini was born and grew up. Uh, Clary Giorsini has been taken to the... Um, uh, she is now being uh, reevaluated uh, as uh, in historic figures because uh, for a long time, uh, just, you know, we had... We knew uh, the Lawrence the Magnificent, <clears throat> Lorenzo il Magnifico, the Lord of Florence, the Lord of the Renaissance, uh, the man who made the, 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 the who made the, the who made Florence, uh, the patron of the arts, etc., etc., uh, and he had a lot of children, and just in very recent times, starting twenty years ago, thanks to the School of Florence, the scholars of the School of Florence, and thanks to also the Medici Archive project in Florence. Um, in, foundation, which was um, the Jane Fortune Foundation, so founded by these American philanthropists, Jane Fortune. So some uh, um, female figures in the history have been, uh, in, are investigated and they're, they're bringing a new light into their role in, in life. Well, Clary Cercini was born here, so she was uh, uh, pretty aware of the family she was from. She knew Nicholas III as one of her important protagonists of, the, of her family. She knew very well the cycle by Masolino da Panicale. She was able really to feel and to um, uh, detect the new, uh, the new times. Uh, she married with uh, uh, Lawrence the Magnificent, uh, yes, and during, uh, shortly before she married, or I mean, some scholars say is that probably uh, that was done little after the marriage with uh, Lawrence the Magnificent, but a huge, massive campaign of restoration works and new construction were undertaken in the palace. Um, and uh, there was a so called Renaissance wing um, to where. Uh, the cycle, the lost cycle belonged to. Um, and the only Renaissance uh, part of the palace left, it is just getting inside, making the left, and there is a small gate. If you go over there, you can see this very small, beautiful uh, Renaissance courtyard, which still has, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his lodge. Uh, and right on top of the um, lentils of the main gate, and that was probably the private apartment of Clarice. Uh, there is this inscription ex Olimpo, uh, which was taken from Arsilio Ficino's writings. Um, so Clarice was a cultivated, educated woman. She, um, yeah, she. Um, she had the opportunity to use uh, the library of one of his uncles, which was stored, preserved inside the Renaissance wing of the of the palace. Let's call it the palace, which fortunately was not destroyed by the burning, uh, because uh, <clears throat> it was donated to uh, to Sistus the Fourth the Pope of the Sistine Chapel, the whole library, those manuscripts and scrolls and incunabulis were donated to Sistus IV, who made the best of it. He created the Vatican Library afterwards. So thanks to the massive donation of the Orsinis to, to, the, to him. And, uh, and Clarice had access to, to this, this uh, to the library, in, which was, um, of course, based mainly into classics, philosophy, and some contemporary history. Um, Clarice, Clarice, Clarice went to went to Florence, and when she gave birth, we know to the Pope too. But uh, <clears throat> then there was the sack, uh, 
and then there was just a few years before the Orsini, where I, what the Orsini had been doing in the downfall, starting from 1517, 5, 1580. So after, you know, the Battle of Lepanto, the downfall started because they had, they dared to go, to, not to be the allies of the Colonna family, who we know were the, the, the primary military force during the battle. Um, so they were still debating and wondering whether having, getting, uh, keeping this palace or uh, selling it. Uh, there was a very short period, which is not still very yet cleared, uh, from circa 1620 to 1628 29, uh, where during which the palace was uh, the seat of uh, um, Accademia dei Desiderosi, uh, that was one of these uh, underground academies in Rome, uh, which had started proliferating. Uh, uh, since uh, again at the, the time of the Counter Reformation, 1580, and we know that uh, this academy was attended by Artemisia Gentileschi. I have some hints that was even uh, place uh, was even attended by Lavinia Fontana right at the very end of his of her, of her, of her lifetime because she didn't she lived not far away from here and all this section all this neighborhood of Rome uh, it is the neighborhood where I have found the highest concentration of women artists I mean residencies of women uh, of women artists uh, well uh, and then when well, the 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 the, 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 the Orsini sold the palace and the uh, Gabrielli um took over and unfortunately again we cannot see it but the baroque wind uh, it is very interesting uh, because uh, it has a quadreria a picture, so it's, it's a picture galleries uh, which are one two three four five rooms in a line um with um paintings done by artists uh, from yes uh, you can see we have Borghesi, Bonesi, Preti, Romanelli, Brandi, Peter Ross, Lamberti, Van den Hecken, Hembrecker, um, Ricci, Sebastiano Ricci, Saiter, Pittoni, um, a, a, a quadreria which has been only recently um, read properly uh, by Antonella Pampalone, who is a local art historian. Uh, who uh, sees in this quadreria apparently just uh, a genre uh, quadreria, so paintings, uh, still life, um, landscapes, still lives, uh, battle scenes, etc. Only the last one, the Sala, <coughs> uh, Sala da Ballo Camerone, sees the presence of mythological and historical subject matters done by Pittoni, Ricci, Brandi, Cider. All the other ones are instead, again, landscapes, still lives, uh, and, and battle scenes. And forever they have been seen and read as a simple, beautiful decoration of the new decoration given by the Gabrielli to their very new uh, <coughs> acquisition, the new palace. Um, instead, there is, um, we cannot see it and we cannot take pictures too, that's the point. There is um, um, a very important uh, um, disclosure uh, of the different times, uh, ages of humans. So starting from the nature, why the nature wise time up to the philosophical approach to religion and history. So that's why there is a kind of progression from the lowest to the, uh, to the last one. And then, and when we're really going, <clears throat> I'm drawing the conclusion, there is another important woman who has been the protagonist in an incredible and uh, still far under uh, evaluated the protagonist of 
the whole art history, not only of the history of these fowls. In the 70s, this lady, I'm going to tell you her name in a minute, created the Incontri Internazionale d'Arte. Graziella Leon Leonardi Buontempo. Uh, you can see her 1928-2010. Uh, and she um, had been traveling to um, US and Germany and, uh, and, and France, UK for a long time during uh, youthful. And, um, and she realized that Rome, even though this is important because, you know, we are sometimes disregarding, uh, now it's not uh, any, I mean, it's not anymore like this way, but for a long time we had been disregarding the role of the Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna and uh, Palma Bucarelli's uh, influence and role in taking it to Italy after World War II, you know, the novelties and the avant-garde from UK, uh, from US and from, uh, from you, yes, from, primarily from US and from France. Um, but yes, uh, Palma Bucarelli realized, um, uh, Leon Graziella Leonardi Buontempo realized that, that you know, the city of Rome was lacking, uh, where is uh, the, uh, Joel, Martin Schoel, so it's still lacking of contemporary art. And so she said, uh, what won't be done by the public institution will be done by me. And so she created this uh, cultural association, Incontro Internazionale d'Arte. And you can see the library, the picture of the library, which is nowadays one of the studios of our students in the ground floor of, um, uh, of the building. And here we can see her with Palma Bucarelli, so the film Direttrice of Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna, uh, and Cristo in Rome in 1974. Here we can see Yannis Cunellis uh, during one of his performances here in, in, again, in a ground floor in the studio. Uh, in 1971, and here we can see Paul Maurice Andy Warhol because she was a very close friend to uh, Andy Warhol, and she took him to to Rome to hear to these uh, um, to these meetings, international meetings, and Alberto Moravia in 1972, who was the emeritus, or was the one I can say honorary uh, president of the association. So he was the one in charge. Of of writing the presentation pretty much every time of the presentation and the, of, of the um, performances and exhibitions. <clears throat> and here it is one of Andy Warhol uh, Award, well, how Andy Warhol awarded the Graziella Leonardi with the screen print and acrylic on canvas uh, work. <clears throat> and a, a drawing with a dedication to Graziella uh, with love in 1975. So actually, Handy Warhol came to Rome thanks to Graziella. Uh, and, uh, and the Roman uh, people from Rome were able to, to, to meet with the new um, the, the pop art and the novelties coming from US thanks to Graziella Leonardi. Uh, Bruce Newman, Newman uh, it's a performance in 1971. Uh, Robert Rosenberg, uh, it's again in 1971. 1971 and 72 represents the peak of her commitments towards these Incontri Internazionale d'Arte, even though she had been living here for 30 years because she had also his uh, residence here in this palace. And then after she, uh, well, where we are now, uh, this is uh, the so-called imperial wing because it was uh, not because of us, <laughs> but because uh, because um, this wing was completely designed and decorated at the beginning of the 1800 by Liborio Cocchetti, um, <clears throat> an interesting fellow of Canova, uh, and who was asked by the Gabrielli. Uh, to depict these uh, these rooms, so today students are not around, so you can go around, uh, and you can see all the other rooms that are all carrying these uh, um, 
frescas <coughs> done by uh, by Cocchetti. Uh, so, in the, by the way, this imperial wing, uh, whereas, uh, whilst um, Gabriel, um, Graziella was having her meetings on the ground floor, where again, now we have the studios of our uh, students of architecture, but this wing was occupied by ENARC, the International um, uh, Association of the uh, Architects. So, where, you know, uh, the most important from Bruno Zevi to Portoghese. Uh, so they used to meet here once uh, a month, if I remember well, for almost 10 or 11 years. So when Graziella died for a coincidence, also the um, International Association of uh, Architecture decided to release the buildings and we came along. So we are in a way feeling um, the um, the the hires have such an incredible history. We are trying uh, to readdress in the field of education. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Simone. This is what we can see. Unless, unless you are not all invited to one of these fancy and beautiful dancing or dinner, Time by time, they organize in the Baroque wing. You can, and you have the chance to see the quadreria. Okay, we have about oh. 15 minutes left I thought. before lunch. Am I right? Yes, we have about 15 minutes left for questions of this morning's session. Sessions. Um, can I like to open the floor? Does anyone have any comments? Or well, the speakers? We have them. Uh, we have Leah online, do we? And and Greta. Um, excuse me. Yes. Let's see if they are online. And Greta and Bar and uh, Leah. They are online. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to make a, a comment more regarding the fluidity of meanings that the female figure has taken on um, in the papers this morning. Um, the shifting meanings, especially of the Judith and Delilah figures. Um, so that the figures, the, the figure of Judith and the figure of, of Delilah, be, they become ambiguous in terms of their representation and their like. Um, and their meaning. Um, Judith, I find problematic in Leia's, um, the artist that Leia has presented, in that, um, the, in Italy anyway, it seems to be a northern, a northern European tradition of the naked Judith. In Italy, and the, the, in the sources, in the, in the, in the Apocrypha and in the patristic literature, it is stressed that um, Judith remains chaste, that she, she seduces Holophanes with her beauty, but, does, but remains um, chasteful. And so I was just wondering how Leia, for example, if you could sort of elaborate on why this figure of of the naked Judith, which associates her more with Salome, as you were saying, than with perhaps the naked truth, which would be a positive interpretation. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, 
I was just frantically trying to find the source. There is the source actually, um, or rather a piece of theatre, um, quite contemporary um, to this appearance of the Naked Judith in Northern Art um, that does uh, elaborate on Judith staying in this camp with Holofernes. Yes. Um, I'm still trying to find that. If I can, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so there is in a sort of uh, profane everyday context of theatre and plays, there is a little bit of, um, uh, you know, imagination running wild and, and thinking about how, how, how this actually played out with Judith and Holofernes because it's such a strange situation of her being in this camp for three days and, you know, nothing happening, basically. Um, so I think there's an element in, in literature, but I do also think it's, um, it's exactly that. I mean, if we look, I don't know if you noticed that, that print by Beham, which is probably one of the most um, referred to in terms of the naked Judith, where she sits uh, on top of the naked form of Holofernes um, with the dagger instead of a sword between her legs in a very suggestive um, position and, and, and gesture. Um, so I think there is a almost maybe joy um, to explore this ambiguity by artists. Um, and but what I find striking is that this is mostly happening in prints and um, later on in paintings. So paintings they start to appear with the naked Judith from like the the 1530s to 40s, and then much later, or a couple of decades later. Um, and so far, the only sculpture I could find is the one by Might. Um, and this is obviously a, a very different medium to display something like this because a print, you know, you could tuck away your trade. It was much cheaper it was affordable you could have a look at this on the side and be like oh you know <laughs> naked lady uh, on this sort of <laughs> um private use aspect of the print whereas this this alabaster sculpture this precious object that was meant to be handled and and held and admired um is a very very different object and i do think that in that regard it's it's not it's not so much the negativity um, of the, or the, the negative aspects of this, like, I dangerous, mean, she's, she's dangerous woman. Yeah, dangerous she, woman. She, she, yes, yes. So, so I think it's, it's, a, it's an interplay. Um, and I'm sure that to Margaret or someone at his court who would have known these new ideas about beauty reflecting um, morality or, or um, a good inner um would have resonated and um this beautiful figure would have been seen as someone exemplary rather than only threatening but the threatening can never be removed and i wonder if there's just a big difference how this would have been seen by a male viewer or a female viewer mm. yeah thank you sorry I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. and Margarita, if you could comment on, sorry, uh, Juliet, do you want to follow up on Leia's discussion or you? Uh, it was a related point, but um, I think that Margarita has already covered it quite well. Margaret, I might want to comment on um, the point that Leia's made and, and then if I may ask my question if it's that yes. order. Great. Okay. Thank you. Which point in regards to <clears throat> sorry. Sorry. I was I was re, uh, was directing my question to Margarita Fratarganjali for Delilah. That, which is, she's here, she's here. Ecola. Yeah, yes, you're, yes. You're to and, next, and if she could. Yes. So, Margarita, you're first. <laughs> yes, if you pick up the, that fluidity of meanings and the ambiguity of the domain farmer and this powerful, strong woman. E, mh, non, non pro, mh, più che donna infame, mh, donna traditrice. Sì. Eh, mh, sì eh, 
che è un, così, un, il tema viene da lontano, ma diciamo um, è molto cavalcato sì. ecco, eh, dagli artisti, dalla letteratura e, e si avvicina a quello che sia Lea che anche eh, Margaret ha, ha, così, ha portato avanti ecco, eh, con un'apertura diciamo, a me mo, è molto interessato eh, per il Novecento. Eh, questa cultura che, che invece diventa diversa nel Novecento con una, le, una lettura molto più contemporanea. Questo mi piacerebbe mh, svilupparlo in modo più calzante, più preciso, e, mh, anche andando, andando oltre poi le arti visive. Ecco. Ok, mi dispiace, we have three, uh, Margaret, Margarita and Greta. <laughs> um, actually, the question is for Margaret, Greta, um, about St. Margarita. I, I think, thank you very much all speakers, but I really enjoyed this um, relationship, this interesting entangling uh, between um, Letty and uh, the the context, the Ursuline context, um, and this shift in iconography, as well as this sort of entangling with Marian, um, a kind of way of, of, of somehow relating this to, you know, the, the Marian iconographies as well, um, circulating in, in Mantua in particular. But there was something I thought very interesting potentially as well about this Ursuline context. And I wonder if you see there to be also a further resonance for potentially the development of the cult of St. Ursula in, in new contexts. We know that obviously during the Counter-Reformation, there was a lot of focus again on St. Ursula um, and her really her interesting sort of very mobile um, iconographies. And I wonder if you see this sort of emergence in the Letty of the greater emphasis on the victorious Margarita as being having a relationship as well with a kind of new inscription or a new um, significance for the Ursuline context here. Yeah, so that's a really interesting um, point. There's a lot of mentions in primary sources of obviously plentiful images of St. Ursula in the convent and in the church, although very few survive of St. Ursula herself. Um, you saw her in Vianney's work, but there wasn't um, anything I don't believe that we know of from the time that still survives. It's also interesting because I did mention the Ursulines because they're important, and that is obviously the order that the convent started out as, but for reasons that we do not currently know, uh, they became, uh, they joined the Franciscan order of the poor Clares um, almost a year after I think the convent was founded. So uh, that's also something interesting to consider was the changing mission um, that Margarita Gonzaga had. Uh, so, I do think that the presence of St. Ursula and there was another, there was another virgin martyr and I'm, the name's escaping me, whose imagery was also very present at the time. And I think that category in general, uh, particularly because the women mentioned do have very physical battles that they fight as well and become victorious were definitely important uh, to the time, to the convent and its location. Great, thank you. Really fascinating, thank you. I'd actually have a question if I may. And uh, thank you all. Can you hear me? Okay, now yes. Uh, my question is for Leah. And Leah, forgive me if I missed this from your um, talk. Uh, you said that the sword wasn't there at some point, right? 
Yes, so um, the first mention, so um, the sculpture is consistently mentioned in inventories from the late 17th century onwards, and it's always described as um, a woman with a dead man's head on a plinth. And then um, at some point in the early 19th century, um, there is this mention of it's a Judith, and she's actually missing her right hand. So there's no mention of she's missing a sword. There's a mention of she's missing her right hand. Um, yeah, so uh, do you know yeah. where it, it was cut? Because from picture, it seems that it was cut just before the wrist. And I was wondering, um, so, because it, it, it would, the position of the arm will tell a lot about the iconography, right? She, yeah. the, the arm is too low to be holding a tray. Um, if she was a son, I don't know. Yes. So um, the first, I don't think it was cut. I mean, it doesn't seem likely. There are other breakages in the um, in in the material. Um, so I think it probably would have been broken rather than yeah. Yeah. Removed. Sorry, that's what I meant. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. And um, it's it's yes, it's right. So as far as I could tell, or was told um, by the by the um, restoration reports as well, as far as there are any, um, it it would have it, it was severed just above the wrist like you say so there wouldn't have been a massively different way to hold that hand and um i don't think it would have been likely for her to have even if she would have been a salome which seems in the context of this iconography of the naked salome that appears so much later so so much later um i don't think it's particularly likely um that she would have been an outright salome i'm not sure happy to be proven wrong um but i also don't think that even if she would have been supposed to be a salome she would have held a plate because usually the plate is attached to the head right so um uh there are there is another example of um a mite sculpture of bronze um that was later drawn by rubens which is just a female figure um with hands held quite delicately on the side like on, I'm sorry, you can't see this, but kind of on hip, hip height, so not raised, but on her side, and um, with no attributes whatsoever, uh, which is quite an extraordinary case as well, I suppose. And um, this must have unsettled room so much that he actually drew her with like a drapery that she was holding in his hands. Um, so I would think, in my point of view, if she wouldn't have held a sword originally, she probably would have just had her hand, you know, on the side of her body empty potentially so there is precedent for you know the empty hand without an attribute necessary without holding anything so i think these are probably the most likely scenarios either a sword originally or um nothing but just you know delicate hand gesture i don't know <laughs> does that thank you answer? Yeah. Ah. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you so much. I have a question for Consuelo. I was uh, kind of taken aback by the sudden appearance of um, Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschenberg in the history of the Palazzo. <laughs> um, and it was particular. There came up a lot of questions. I was particularly interested in um, the sudden or the the um, the import of all these formative and installation practices and how it maybe changed its meaning or it altered its meaning in the in the context um, of the in the architectural context of the palazzo but maybe uh, a question in a more technical sense I was interested to know how because you said um, that the support of the contemporary arts back then in Rome was not very uh, present so or so and so. Um, so, how did she actually finance um, her undertaking, and um, what was the support structure that she was able to refer to? Uh, yes. <clears throat> well, first of all, <clears throat> it's just to <clears throat> not to be to be upfront. She came from a very upper class family and she married a very wealthy man. And um, so most of the support came from her own belongings as a kind of self-taxation. And then through the Associazione Culturale, the Cultural Association Incontro Internazionale d'Arte, uh, 
Uh, no, we will not see here. But um, those who, who were um, members of uh, members of the um, the association had to pay an annual fee. She destined to the kind of grants for travel expenses and setting up the exhibitions, uh, etc. And that is why, by the way, when she became uh, uh, older, less strength and committed because of the lack of the energies, her own lack of energies, the, 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 the association started to go in a in kind of downfall or the, she was less present and then Moravia died, uh, Rosenberg died. So also now the, those who, who uh, we are contributing uh, to this uh, flourishing golden time of contemporary art in Rome were present, were no more present. It failed, it fade, fading and failed over, uh, over the times. And, um, and so she has left. Uh, the small archive, little archive, just by a coincidence, an absolute coincidence, I met, uh, I knew her uh, niece, yes, her niece, uh, and, uh, and she told me that she has some sheets and some documents, but very little has left. So the um, has been published. Yes, it's a book because it is a book uh, with very scarce documentation. It came out. Um, I should remember now very well, but might be ten years ago, or less than ten years ago. Uh, but I think there is a lot to do on her to to, to try to better understand who she was and what she. She had done, um, even because some most of the times, uh, you know, in the 70s and uh, worstly in the 80s, the Roman bourgeoisie uh, was this kind of half, you know, Janus. So it was one side of the token where people already committed with the actual um, investigations and love for contemporary art, but it was the other side of the token who was instead more interested in the venues, in the you know, in the openings, and just I'm, I was there, and they have left little behind, if not you know some pictures they're taken with Warhol rather than Rosenberg, etc. And and so <clears throat> that's my convinced opinion that there is a lot to do and to discover about her role. Even because when Palma Bucarelli <clears throat> retired from her role, uh, the directrice of um, uh, Galleria Nazionale, uh, and, um, they really opened a new season uh, in the contemporary art in Rome, which it is not that that was necessarily better than the previous one, <laughs> and they said, oh. <laughs> so if we have any more comments or questions, we shall re, ah, yes. Sorry, is that me? Can I, sorry. Yeah, yeah. okay. Sorry, um, I was just wondering, um, I'm, after Greta, your talk, I was just struck again by how just how odd and extreme it is to uh, undress a figure such as Judith. Um, and um, especially looking at the sort of heroic um, representations of, of St. Margaret, uh, I, I kept on wondering what the sort of, um, what the deciding factor is that one of these female figures goes towards, you know, a representation <laughs> that is, um, very tricky in a way and quite negative and the other one it remains a positive female strong female exemplar and I kept wondering I don't know if you've got any thoughts is it is it the woman is it one is the is a Christian saint the other one is an Old Testament um, a, a Jewish heroine 
or is it the person that she that they conquer one you know um a, a personification of satan an actual personification of satan and the other uh a man a dangerous one but a man and i i I, I don't know, maybe there's a third option. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, but still the the man is Holophanes and he's the enemy. And he's often with the Judith and Hophanes, it's also um represented as the conqueror, uh, as as the militant church conquering the infidel. And um so yes. I have a, I do have a problem with the naked Judas very much, but uh, that might be my problem. <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that. <laughs> no, it's just it's just that as I said, I, I I know the Italian context, and the the Northern European seems to me to relate her more to the balding grain figure, balding grain figures of death and the maiden and. Um, uh, Lu Lucas Cranach's Venus, and it's uh, you know they're sexualized um, fig female figures, and I and I see the the sculpture is related to that tradition rather than to Judith as as a warrior woman overcoming the enemy, overcoming sin, etc. Although I do find that there is. A discrepancy, or there is a difference um, between the sculpture Judith and, um, and for example, the prince, the northern prince of Judith. I do feel like there is a, a gradient in sexualization, if you will, or um, uh, there is a remaining bit of ambiguity on how this figure is supposed to be perceived or how it can be perceived. Whereas um, some of the some of the prints and especially the paintings kind of don't leave a lot of room for for a different interpretation than a widely temptress. Um, I, I, if I may real quick I definitely um, agree with Dr. Modesti regarding the naked Judith um, but specifically also because I do know the Italian traditions but I think you were talking about this earlier a little bit Leah um, um, and Dr. Modesti about how there is an incredible emphasis on Judith's story of her chastity um and with saint margaret i know there when i was doing research the fact that she was a virgin the fact that the nuns also and many of the inhabitants of the convent took vows of chastity um or were widows those were the conditions um i that was tied to a woman's ability to conquer as well um to have that sort of moral uh, perfectness for lack of a better term uh, so yeah just knowing what I know I think what the answer to the question might also have to do with the time and the place um, and who was depicting these figures I think that's the biggest disconnect and uh, but yeah that's a really interesting thought thank you thank you Greta any other comments? If not, we'll um, reconvene at 2.30 or 2? 2.30 is fine. It's 1.15. 2.30 is fine. Just to tell you something, that before we go to the Palazzo Spad, I would like to take a group picture uh, by the fountain and the ramping bear <laughs> in their, in their scene is cut of arm. And um, this is <clears throat> very <clears throat> breaking the news. So if you like to be connected with the IUARC, there will be a newsletter released, uh, I think, every two months. Uh, so if you want to, to stay tuned and uh, <clears throat> updated with our next um, steps uh, and also uh, interesting um, news that we will be coming out soon. You can subscribe to through the website. Yes. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to anticipate nothing. But Sorry. Literally twenty seconds. Yeah. News flash for um, colleagues interested in the iconography of um, strong women slaying bears. 
because okay. the Austini and the Ursulines have really interconnected across the session. There is a very interesting Celtic saint, Cornish saint, St. Q, K-E-W, who arrived in North Cornwall. And not only she subdued a man, and she slayed a bear. And there's a wonderful stained glass window of her in St. Q's Church, North Cornwall. And I think another sort of fascinating question there of that iconography, does it travel? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Juliet. Have a nice meal. St. Q. Huge. D K -E -W. Ah, K -E, K -E -W -Q. Thank you. Enjoy your meal. See you later.
Good afternoon and <clears throat> welcome back to this um, last session of um, IUAC, third edition. Uh, the session Warrior Women, Representation and Iconography. Uh, the, to, uh, this afternoon's uh, session will be opened by uh, Elisa Stafferini, who is a PH student at the Warburg Institute, where she works on a thesis titled The Women in the Arms, Female Warriors, in Italian art, 1500-1700. I'm sorry, there is a problem with the connection. First, so I'm sorry. As I said, we have Patricia Rocco connected from New York. So Elisa, please hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry to postpone your talk once more. So, welcome, Patricia. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, next, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, next speech is by Patricia Rocco, uh, who received a PhD from the Graduate Center CUNY and is adjunct professor of art history at Hunter College, Manhattan School of Music, and Cooper Union. She has published articles on women artists, gender, and material culture, especially women's work with textiles. Her book, The Devout Hand, Women, Virtual and Visual Culture and Early Modern Ridley, has been um, recently published by McGill Queen's University Press. Rock has, al uh, Rock has also published the two chapters on popular prints and games in the early modern world, Virtuous Vices, Giuseppe Maria Militelli's Gambling Prints and the Social Marketing of Leisure and Gender in Post um, Trident in Bologna in play things in early modernity party games world games mind games and the world upside down giuseppe maria militelli's games and performance mm -hmm. of identity in early modern work in games and game playing in early modern art and uh, literature patricia rocco is uh, presenting uh, um, <clears throat> a talk titled From Victim to Virago, Women, Word and Violence in Early Modern Art. Please, uh, Patricia, yeah, the stage is yours. Okay. Is, is the volume on? Yes? Yes, it's fine. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, that's all I want to know. So thank you, Consuelo and uh, Adelina, for inviting me to this fantastic conference. And thanks, of course, to the University of Arkansas for promoting uh, this wonderful topic year after year. Um, so uh, the title of my topic there, yes, I, I think I modified it a bit, but the same idea, right? Women more in the visual arts from victim to virago and actually a little beyond. Um, in discussing women in war, or better, the impact of war on women as seen through the eyes of women artists, there are several characters from biblical text, history, and myth whom we encounter again and again in early modern visual arts. Timoclea, Portia, Cleopatra, and finally, perhaps most often and well-known, Judith. Uh, in the past, some of these women have been discussed as the femme forts, and indeed they are heroines that were forged and have emerged from the wartime strife. We can more closely examine the struggles of these women as part of the larger global picture of women, women artists, and the consequences of wartime due to the socio-historical conditions and the constructions of gender that are still operating in our own time. Um, as a framing context, uh, period terms we use such as Virgo or Virgin and Virago, which was manly courage in a woman. But as we know, language is loaded and carries with it multiple connotations of identity and identities. What follows is not a comprehensive analysis, but rather an attempt to map these complex relationships onto a wider picture that begins in the early modern period, but continues into present day. My own research is indebted to the work of the many other great scholars on this topic, uh, many of them present today and in this conference. Um, war became the lens and the context through which these women artists explored complex identities, experience, and expectations, and the visual arts was the vehicle for their unique expression. Um, okay. 
We could certainly start with the Bolognese artist Elisabetta Serrani and her painting of Timoclea. Uh, the, apparently the poster child for the conference, which I did I did not know when I put this together, but of course it's, it's a perfect poster. Um, Sirani presents a very different view from the typical version of this character as painted by male artists. Timoclea's act is that of a vengeful woman. However, it's a righteous revenge, something the viewer cannot but sympathize with based on the artist's choice of narrative moment. Um, Tim McClay is shown at the moment the matron is taking her revenge on one of Alexander's, the great's generals who raped her, taking her body as part of his war booty. A desperate woman violated and exploited, she decides to try to level the playing field and tells the general that she's hidden money and jewels at the bottom of the well. And as the greedy general appears over the edge, not satisfied with the carnal booty he stole, she hastens to give him a good shove and send him tumbling into the well head first. In contrast, the versions painted by male artists usually show Timoclea being dragged in front of Alexander for sentencing and punishment. Although she faces a probable death sentence, in the end, Alexander is so moved by her bravery and plight that he grants her clemency for her transgression. Saran even includes a uh, sculpted relief from the lapis and centaurs, a reference to lust as moral chaos versus civilized order, uh, as it is also on the Parthenon reliefs. Um, in Serrani's image of Portia, we have the story of a woman at a time of political insurrection in ancient Rome, caught in the power struggle of a war between the Republic and the imperial ambitions of Caesar. Portia is trying to convince her husband, Brutus, that she is worthy of the sacrifices necessary for the political coup to unseat Caesar, the dictator. As proof of her strength, she stabbed herself in the thigh with a blade. The blade may be a knife or even a sewing needle, the very instrument used in the background by the other women in the story. Those women are participating in the traditionally most feminine of all activities, embroidery. Indeed, this is relevant as the patron was uh, the silk merchant, Simone Tassi. So while the women in the background are pursuing their sewing, Portia is displaying her virtue and manly courage in a language of violence that is the only language she feels her husband will understand. Um, as Modesti has mentioned, her muscular body is reminiscent of Amazonian strength uh, and also ancient goddesses such as Minerva and Diana. In Sirani's hands, via the painter's brush, the blade becomes the agent of rebellious resistance to men's historical limitations on women. The artist is setting up a paragone between Portia's blade and her own painter's brush as agents of feminine forza and virtu. Cleopatra, however, is the ultimate ambiguous heroine, or even anti-heroine, perhaps, the powerful Egyptian ruler queen who has been co-opted for male audiences as a constructed fantasy of vulnerable female flesh for male consumption as created by the hand of male artists. On the one hand, she's presented as a powerful female ruler, yet on the other, she's also a victim of historical distortion as the evil temptress who steals Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar from their proper allegiances to Rome. She's been maligned as the evil seductress, where the focus in most of these images by male artists has been her seductive nature. The suicide itself was generally depicted by male artists as a weak moment for the subject, but a tantalizing one for the historically male viewer. Serrani's warrior queen is not shown fighting in battle armor, and yet the artist's choice of moment is significant. As a ruler, Cleopatra's political acumen was reputedly lauded, as was her skill in negotiations. This perfectly synchronizes with Serrani's choice of moment, um, most probably from Plutarch. Serrani chose the moment that Cleopatra places a bet with Mark Anthony, a bet which is just about to win, that she could spend 10,000 sesterces in one night, and indeed, she does this by dissolving a giant pearl in a cup of vinegar and then drinking it. In some ways, Cleopatra is also that pearl, the exotic woman that brought down the great Caesar and the mighty Mark Anthony, and almost Rome itself, but destroyed herself in the process. Normally, the pearl is a symbol of the purity of the virgin, and yet in this case, it comes to embody the virile queen, female ruler of Egypt. Here the pearl is the key to a witty bet which passes the reins of power to Cleopatra, although in the end we know that she is defeated by Octavian. But even then this virago will have her victory and commit suicide using the asp rather than be taken captive. The snake is a powerful ancestral symbol, but when chosen as a mode of female suicide, 
um, it proved uh, it's proved an animal whose erotic charge is too tempting for most other male artists to resist when transmitting the tale. For the most glaring example of this unabashed exploitative eroticism regarding Cleopatra's death, we need look no further than Guido Cagnati's version. Here we have pure eroticism where death has been made into a fetish of violence and eroticism. Together, the sexy, vulnerable female suicide by phallic snake. Sirani's Cleopatra, dressed in all her finery and displaying not her body for the consumption of the male viewer, but her intellectual acumen, which apparently far outstrips that of her male adversary as she wins the bet. This is not to say that women artists did not produce erotic imagery, as we know they did, right? We can think of Lavinia Fontana's Minerva dressing for Cardinal, for none other than Cardinal Scipione Borghese, but they seem to eschew eroticism for eroticism's sake in favor of narrative clarity. Um, and now we come to one of the most prevalent images of women in war in the early modern period, the story of Judith and Holofernes, which I will take into contemporary times during my discussion. Um, a compelling image of a woman in wartime, the biblical story of Judith and Holofernes revolves around the assassination of the Assyrian tyrant Holofernes, who lays siege to the town of Bethulia. Our heroine Judith marshals all of her feminine wiles to seduce him without losing her virtue, of course, in order to kill him and save her people from his armies. She accomplishes this by sneaking into his tent, dressed to kill, plying him with drink until he's too drunk to stand. And as he sleeps off his drunken stupor, she cuts off his head with the assistant of her maidservant, Abra. And the Assyrian's defeat is assured. That she remains the virtuous biblical heroine, not having compromised for purity during her brave and very virile task is a critical part of the story. Sirani's version, also for the banker Catalani, is in the key of Donatello's ascetic example. The demurely covered but ruthlessly effective killing machine, a la Uma Thurman's character in Quentin Tarantino's Orgy of Violence, Female Violence, Kill Bill. Now, there are many other genders there that we could discuss, but alas, we, we don't have time for that. So another time. Sirani depicts Judith in an ambitious nighttime scene, a dramatic heroine on the theatrical stage, holding up Holofernes' severed head for all the people of Bethulia to see, a righteous and virtuous act on public display. Certainly this version was not produced in a vacuum, and as Modesti points out uh, so beautifully, was also supported by a body of period literature, dramatic productions, and sermons that glorified strong women and their participation in civic and religious activities, especially in Bologna. Um, we can even take this farther back to um, you know, uh, Pagliotti's work as cardinal in Bologna and involving the women of the city in participation. Sirani's predecessor, the 16th century artist Lavinia Fontana, had also painted the heroine Judith, and in her version it was seen that she chose to embody the character perhaps as a self-portrait, um, a bold and brave choice to cast herself as the virtuous and virile heroine. Virtue itself is a term which comes from, of course, vir or man, virile or manly, and thus virago, as it's uh, coming from this, can only be manly strength in a woman, while virgo would be its chaste but weaker op opposite. However, linguistically, of course, la virtu is female, right? It's interesting to note the male counterpart to the scene of Judith and Holofernes, which is David and Goliath, but in Caravaggio's version, the artist places his features on the severed head of the giant, choosing to depict himself as the victim monster instead of David the hero. We can only imagine this must have been done in a desperate moment of pessimism or repentance for his sins in his life, which of course would lead us down a Freudian path as the sword is placed directly between his legs. Uh, whereas for Fontana, the vehicle of Judith and Holofernes is used then as, as an embodiment of female bravery and heroism. Yeah, so we also can't miss a moment, just a brief moment, to examine Caravaggio's Judith and Holofernes alongside that of our famous Baroque artist Artemisia Gentileschi. Of course, this is a very familiar, well-worn comparison from the classroom. Uh, it nonetheless neatly illustrates the subtleties of gender discourse and iconography. Same subject, style, period, and yet Caravaggio's Judith is somewhat frigid, delicate and frozen, a delicate and frozen heroine accomplishing her task with a certain distaste for the job and literally at arm's length. Meanwhile, Gentileschi's Judith digs in with gusto and with the assistance of her maid. Their hands are crossed at the center, forming the righteous crooks of the narrative, literally the shape of a cross. 
Obviously, being privy to Gentileschi's biography and the story of her rape by uh, the painter Tassi, whom her father, Orazio, had hired to help train her, one can certainly read quite a bit into Gentileschi's versions of Judith. Although it's rumored that art historians may sometimes go over the deep end in their interpretations, right? Who? Us? Never. <laughs> but in this instance, if we look at the visual evidence left behind, some of the urgency of Artemisia's version um, versus that of her father's, the same subject is quite uh, evident. Um, Arachia's figures appear frozen as in a strange tableau vivant, peopled by stiff mannequins, although both are talented painters, his daughter's version is much more compelling uh, beyond doubt, a scene of the dramatic consequences of war when a woman takes up the sword or the brush against men. Since Judith remained a kind of vehicle for the image of female bravery, she was at times co-opted by the male patriarchy to reveal other less positive sides of feminine nature as constructed by male hegemony. The Northern artist Lucas Cranach gives us a good example of the visual, moral, and iconographical fallout from this theme in the eyes of the male artist. In his portrait of Judith on the left, she's simply holding the severed head and the sword, but a metamorphosis occurs um, when we place this Judith side by side with Cranach's Salome. And uh, I'm indebted, of course, to Cialetti for this, this comparison, but Salome is the one who requested the head of John the Baptist as per her mother's instructions. After performing the dance of the seven veils, um, Herodotus was so incensed with desire for her that he acquiesced to her request for the head of the Baptist. So she has been posited as the true embodiment of all the dangerous feminine wiles, the extreme version of the evil woman and femme fatale. If we compare the two images, the only major difference between their iconography is the presence of the plate and the lack of the sword. There's a visual suggestion, therefore, that the line between female heroine and evil seductress is quite thin for the female subject. Um, a combination of both Virgo and Virago that emerges from the biblical tale, yet is embellished by legends and later artists and writers. Visually or morally, you could easily exchange one image for the other here, as they can be two sides of the same coin a somewhat misogynistic interpretation then of these women on the moral cusp. Here we enter into the trope of the Weibermarkt or pernicious power of woman as noted also by Gerard and Chilati. The message is that apparently it takes very little for women to cross that porous line from Virgo into Virago and then on to witch. We have only to glance at some of the propagandistic images of women as witches from the period to know that the topos was alive and well, including allusions to the infamous 15th century Malleus Maleficarum. Uh, the German artist here, Hans Balding Grün's print of the witch's Sabbath gives us an idea of the characterization of naked women riding brooms in the dark of night, frolicking with mysterious creatures in the woodlands. The danger for men, then, is again underlined in Grun's print with the bewitched groom here, where the groom appears dead or petrified in a horse stable, and a haggard woman or witch looks on from the window. Um, the alternative role model to this would have been uh, perhaps the pious Mary Magdalene, right, who went from sinner or whore to virtuous follower uh, of Christ, right, from sinner to saint. But even she was subject to eroticizing interpretation of the flesh by artists such as Titian, where the, the nipple reigns supreme, as compared to Gentileschi's choice of moment of the Magdalene's renunciation of her worldly goods uh, as courtesan. If we fast forward to the turn of the century and follow the fortunes of Judith as a theme here, in the hands of modern male artists such as Gustav Klimt and Franz Stuck, we see glimpses of Freudian fantasies of Judith once again, as the extremely highly sexed Virago, the visual reconstruction of the dangerous femme fatale, who certainly represents the very real threat of castration here for anyone fortunate, unfortunate enough to become ensnared in her dangerous wiles. In Klimt's version, Judith is seen with her mouth slightly open and her eyes in a dreamy gaze, half-closed lids tempting the viewer with her mesmerizing beauty, which the artist emphasizes um, with his use of gold in the painting, turning her into an icon of alluring sexuality. Stuck's image is a brazen nude where Judith holds and caresses the sword at her side, almost as if it were a giant phallus. These versions display the journey this character undergoes for many male artists from femme fatale sorry, excuse me, from femme fort uh, to femme fatale versus the reverse journey from victim to virago as we have seen uh, from many of our female artists. And uh, now I'd like to just conclude with two contemporary artist versions of these warring women. Now let's take this conversation to the modern effects um, 
of wars in order to come full circle. Um, okay. Uh, through the theme of Judith, we can discuss various types of conflicts, including the struggles with race in our modern society, using the version of Judith by Kahinda Wiley, 2012. Wiley is a contemporary African-American artist who often responds to canonical works of art with his own interventions on race and gender, utilizing costume and background patterns uh, that in this example are reminders of Rococo art, among other things, to question conventional markers of male versus female taste. Judith, who has now become an African-American woman, is decapitating not Holofernes, but a white female. This white female figure represents for Wiley the Western classical canon in art history, a different kind of war. The white woman stands in for the Assyrian tyrant Holofernes, now an echo of post-colonial significance in the tyranny of the racial struggle for equality in the traditional narrative of art history, as well as in the larger arena of life. And uh, finally, to bring this to an even more recent event, uh, in terms of discussing women in war and waging war via art, uh, we should discuss, um, we could discuss some of the Ukrainian artists involved um, in the ongoing tragic conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. Um, here we have a photograph by the Ukrainian artist Katerina Yermoleva, entitled Photo Number no. Two on the left. It is a photograph that explores and speaks to in issues of bigenderism in queer theory and questions the idea of traditional gender roles in wartime. Uh, the image is a self-portrait of the artist, an ambiguous mixed gender costume and makeup that presents and explores her identity both as a traditional Ukrainian female with a bright floral headpiece, makeup, and jewelry, but also at the same time as a male with a defining masculine mustache. The image represents some of the artist's avatars, or multiple identities, um, in her own words, that were born as a result of her anxiety and trauma during the conflicts um, in the annexation of Crimea, even before the present Russian-Ukrainian conflict began. There's a splitting of personhood here, a fragmenting of identity as a way of coping and a desire to represent or communicate this process to others. This reminds us of how identity and gender roles can be abandoned or suppressed, mm -hmm. redefined or upended during war, presented as all manner of boundaries, but boundaries that are crossed during conflict. Uh, this is a photo that speaks to sex workers as well as both captured women and men, um, all those victims of violence and violations, boundaries and spaces penetrated by a foreign enemy, victims of war and all its distortions. Women artists here are trying to make sense of that which has no sense. War is indeed the moment when the world is upside down, so this might remind us of a link to early modern times, the gender reversals that happened during Carnival, for example, as seen in the print by the 17th century Bolognese artist Mitelli. Somehow this print just keeps coming back for me, so <laughs> some of you may have seen it. Um, the characters here are depicted as Hercules and Iole with the motto, quote, Sad is the home where the chicken crows and the cock is silent. The female figure's cross-dressing signifies the idea of women taking up the club of Hercules, while Hercules is left to weave, of all things, at the loom. War is thus a moment when everything seems upside down, and yet women struggle to adapt and survive in a situation which they often have no part in constructing, where even their bodies, seen as physically weaker, are oppressed by a hostile and brutal male force. Simply because of historical and social convention, women can often bear a large part of the heavy burden the consequences of war is in this portrait. One prays that this may change in the future, but in the meantime, uh, suffering continues. Um, I just want to add that I couldn't help but link these ideas of artistic identity to the wonderful presentation by Fatima Husseini on Wednesday regarding the consequences of conflict to women and their sense of self. Uh, but of course, in her case, she focused on the beauty that is there just breathing beneath the surface of their everyday life to be captured um, by her camera. And uh, so I leave you with Yermaleva's self-portrait here uh, and some other images um, as a final comment to sort of bring uh, everything full circle on the idea of women in war and women artists in war and how the suffering and struggle can be viscerally expressed by the gaze, the hands, the heart, and the soul of a woman artist from victim to virago and beyond, right? Perhaps someday in the, in the middle world. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much. And there, here we go. Um, Elisa, Elisa Stafferini. 
So Elisa is a PhD student of Arbogun Institute, where she works on a thesis titled The Women in, the Arm, in Arms, Female Warriors in Italian Art, 1500 1700. The project focuses on the ethical and, ethical and political allusions of armed women in 16th and 17th century Italian painting and was awarded a Saxo Gombrich Scholarship. Prior to her PhD, Elisa studied at Sapienza Università di Roma, where she graduated a bachelor and a master summa cum laude. She was a then fast graduate fellow at the University of Oxford, predoctoral fellow of the Kunst Historisch Institute in Florence, and visiting student at Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa. Her academic interests focus on early modern art and visual culture, iconography and iconology, gender and politics, world studies, and the inter interrelations between world and image. She has presented at international conferences and lectured extensively on Renaissance art and iconography, both in Italy and UK. So we're welcome to listen to Elisa's talk, um, uh, Worthy Opponents, a Representation of Female Warriors in Early Modern Art and Literature. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, first, let me spare a moment to thank Consuelo and Adelina to, organize, to have organized this wonderful conference. Uh, Professor Fortunati for being here, Fabio for the technical assistance. And I also want to show my gratitude to the Warburg Institute and the Society for the Study of Early Modern Women and Gender for their travel grants, which enabled me to be here. Uh, I'm now starting my presentation. Epic poetry is about war, and for it to be war, there must be enemies. Female warriors normally parade among the ranks of the enemies, those who are destined to be defeated. This is the case of the Scythian Amazons, who come to the aid of the Trojans and valiantly fight on the battlefield until their queen, Penthesilea, is killed by Achilles, the Greek hero. Or of Virgil's Camilla, an Italic leader who bravely opposes Aeneas' troops and dies in an ambush, without even having the honor of a single combat with the main hero. The phenomenon extends to medieval and early modern chivalric poems, where the vast majority of female fighters emerge as opponents to Christian armies, suffice to mention Ludovico Ariosto's Marfisa and Torquato Tasso's Clorinda. Besides being enemies, warrior women are others in a broader sense and for a number of reasons. In ancient and medieval ethnographic accounts, Amazonian societies are described as an emblem of an inverted world. Amazons do not fulfill traditional female roles. Instead, they hunt, ride astride their horses like men, wage war, and hold power. Moreover, they are characterized by an element of exoticism. Coming from remote lands where barbarian customs apply, not only do they bear arms to defend themselves from enemies, but they also slaughter innocent men, cauterize their own breasts, and kill or mutilate their male sons to maintain a genocracy. The fictional heroines who, from the late 15th century, proliferate in chivalric epics are built on the Amazonian myth in classical literature. They are, however, also influenced by another model, that of Virgil's Camilla. Virgil, in in the Aeneid, obscures the geographical otherness displayed by the Amazons, depicting an Italian queen on the battlefield. Moreover, he places her at the head of an army composed also by men, implicitly defining his heroine as different from the Amazons, to whom the reputation of men haters was attached. This mediation helps to soften some of the most controversial characteristics of the fictional viragos so that when they reappear in medieval and early modern literature, although some elements of otherness are maintained, others disappear. This talk explores, through case studies, how the motive of the belligerent woman is changed and reinterpreted several times in literature and art in ways that lessen the controversial aspects originally attributed to it. Starting from the 13th century, in chivalric romances and heroic poems, the warrior woman transforms into a character with predominantly positive qualities. She can transition from being an enemy to an ally through marriage, conversion, or both. This reassessment is also reflected in visual depictions, where these female opponents can transform into ideal brides, symbols of national identity, and even representations of the power of Christianity. 
Firstly, we analyze the process that sees Amazons turning from misandric warriors to ideal brides. This transformation has been extensively explored from a literary perspective by various scholars such as Latella, Stoppino, and Milligan. A significant factor contributing to this change is the emergence of new literary genres. From the 13th century onwards, female warriors, were interpreted by French authors and placed in a chivalry context, take on some of the traits of the courtly tradition. They fall in love, or others fall in love with them. The theme of love holds, uh, also holds great importance in the earliest heroic poem in Italian literature, Boccaccio's De Zeda, written around 1339. This text, which introduces the Amazonian theme into vernacular Italian literature, was a popular subject for 15th century wedding chests, as testified by these two frontals attributed to Domenico di Michelino. The first one is a faithful visual translation of the battle between the Greeks and the Amazons, as narrated by Boccaccio in the first book of his poem. The book begins with a description of the Amazonian society, which echoes ancient accounts. Amazons are guilty of having murdered their husbands, sons, and male relatives. Their hatred against men is the main reasons why the Greek, led by Theseus, declare war on them. The panel shows, on the left, Theseus' troops approaching the shores of the city, challenged, as Boccaccio recounts, by the Amazons' anger. In the text, the women for a moment prevail. However, soon after that, that the battle turns in favor of the Greeks. In the panel, to clarify their gender, the Greeks are depicted in full armor with spears, bows, and shields, while the women wear colorful long dresses accompanied again by shields and weapons. Their helmets, some of which appear to be Frisian, are employed to underline the, Amazon, the Amazon's Asian roots. Several Amazons are depicted dead on the ground, while others on the background are seen beating a retreat inside the fortress. So far, the battle does not differ from a typical ancient Amazonomachy, where the Amazons serve a challenging test for the main hero, who valiantly defeats them. We have mentioned, however, that love plays an important part in this poem. After the battle, Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, is forced to admit her women's physical inferiority to Theseus. The hero, instead of taking advantage of the situation to finally vanquish the Amazons, accepts the queen's surrender and falls in love with her. The peace negotiation thus includes a marriage between the two commanders, and this is then followed by other marital unions between Amazons and Greek soldiers. The marriage is displayed in the second panel by Domenico di Michelino. On the right, the Amazons inside the fortress are still opposing the Greeks. At the center, Hippolyta and Theseus negotiate peace and marry, surrounded by the two armies. And on the left, we find Hippolyta again ready to depart with Theseus in the direction of Athens. In the Theseida, the wedding signals the end of female militancy. Boccaccio claims that once defeated, the women altered their appearance, returning to the way they used to be, beautiful, charming, fresh, and graceful. This clearly establishes that their militancy was only a temporary phase. Once married, they will never return to their warlike life. For this reason, modern scholars and feminist theorists have often interpreted the marriage as a mean to domesticate the heroine, who, to exist in late medieval and early modern culture, needs to be tamed and brought back to the traditional female role of wife. While this is undoubtedly true, this device has also allowed the warrior women to quite literally survive. Boccaccio Zeda adds a second path to the traditional and doomed destiny of the warrior lady. When she does not die, she turns into a bride. In this poem, the Amazonomachy is thus linked with conjugal love making the Tezaida a suitable subject for Cassone painting commissioned and produced as gift to newlyweds. Around 20 years after the Tezaida, Boccaccio revisits the Amazonian theme in his work De Mulieribus Claris. This widely read and translated Latin text comprises biographies of renewed women, including the Amazons Marfesia, Lampedo, Antiope, Orizia, and Penthesilea. Marfesi and Lampedo are noted for their military skills. 
Orizia for her perpetual virginity, and Penthesilea, also described as a virgin, for her intelligence and deeds. In Boccaccio, virginity is a quality often connected to militarism and is also one of the main characteristics of another virago who features in his catalogue, the already mentioned Camilla. Camilla, the warrior woman of the Aeneid, is a composite character inspired by earlier mythological figures like the Antres Atalanta and the Amazon Penthesilea. She inherits chastity and virility from the Amazons, but fights alongside men rather than against them. Moreover, Unlike the Sitian Amazons, Camilla is an Italic queen who joins Turnus, the king of the Rutulians, in his struggle against the, invad the invading Trojans led by Aeneas. This war will result in the foundation of Rome. Similar to the Amazons, Camilla is celebrated as a symbol of fortitude and chastity in the late medieval and early modern period. However, unlike the exotic Amazons, she is also viewed as a representation of Italic pride. In Dante's Inferno, the Virgin Camilla is celebrated for her courageous sacrifice for Italy, her homeland. The second case study concentrates on warrior women as symbol of national and civic identities. Around 1550, the artist Nicola de Labate produced the most extensive cycle dedicated to Camilla's story. This is a fresco frieze located in Palazzo Poggi in Bologna and commissioned by the Cardinal Giovanni Poggi. The frieze adheres faithfully to the 11th book of the Aeneid, where Camilla's story is narrated. Scenes of her life, from her childhood to her death, appear as a continuous narrative on the walls of this room and present the heroine as an emblem of various virtues, including fortitude and chastity. Particularly interesting in the context of Camilla as a patriotic symbol, is the decoration of the southern wall, which displays the, moment of, uh, the last moments of Camilla's life, her death in the battlefield and her apotheosis. In the poem, the fierce Camilla is killed in an ambush. This happens, Virgil tells us, because after having performed incredible deeds on the battlefield, Camilla becomes captivated by the magnificent armor of one of her enemies, Glorious. Glorious, in the poem, is a Phrygian priest who fought for the Trojans. Ignoring all others, Camilla pursues Glorious, intending to arm his arms in a temple or adorn herself with captured gold. This destruction proves fatal, as she's, an, as she's unexpectedly attacked by Arons, an Etruscan warrior who spears her in the chest while she gallops after Glorious. In Palazzo Poggi, the ambush is displayed in the right background. But the real protagonist of this incident is the character on the left foreground. As noted by Vera Fortunati and Sylvie Began, this figure is not Aaron's, as it was previously suggested. However, it remains of difficult identification. On the basis of text image correspondences, I suggest this warrior could be Clarius. The priest is described in the poem wearing Phrygian armor and a golden helmet. He wears a knotted saffron cloak and carries a golden bow, all elements which feature in the mural painting. Moreover, Glorius is a priest of Sibylle, a polyad divinity who, as protector of cities, is shown in visual art wearing a mural crown representing the city walls. This would explain why he's also wearing one. Interestingly, though, the etiquette worn by Glorius appears to be not just a small scale generic city, but a specific one the city of Bologna, where Palazzo Poggi is located. This raises a question, why does Bologna, what does Bologna have to do with Camilla, one of the protagonists of Rome's foundation myth? In the absence of documentation, any theory that might account for the inclusion of the city in Camilla's frieze must remain speculative. However, an emblem by Achille Bocchi, whose involvement in Palazzo Poggi has been speculated by art historians, will provide a clue to answer this question. It represents the Republican government and features at the center, the city of Bologna as an armed woman. She's surrounded by the banner Libertas at home with the motto Bologna Docet, a scroll bearing the letters SPQB, the Senate and the people of Bologna, a coat of armor and a miniature panorama similar to that of Palazzo Poggi.
The text, which comes with this emblem, starts with the phrase the city of Bologna protects itself by ruling itself, and it refers to a specific ideological and political moment of Bolognese history, the years following the deposition of the Bentivoglio family in the 1520s, when power was transferred to a group of 40 noble senators. Bocchi's emblem has been read as a patriotic glorification of Bologna and as a revival of the myth of Republican Rome in his own patria. In this context, Camilla could assume a similar patriotic nuance. Despite being represented as, presented as one of Aeneas' opponents, the heroine is praised in the poem for being committed to her homeland and, in a way, even identifiable with it. In Virgil's narration, her ally, Turnus, calls her Deacus Italia Virgo, a maiden pride of Italy. The idea of Camilla as an ethnic symbol has been acknowledged by scholars of literature and could apply to images as well. In Palazzo Poggi, after her death, Camilla's corpse and her weapons are consigned to the goddess Diana, who will bury them in the land of her fathers. Camilla is dead, but her death, more than a punishment, is a sacrifice that will contribute to the foundation of Rome and Italy. Her involvement in war and her consequent sacrifice can thus be read as a model of love for one's native land. Among the various epic female warriors inspired by Camilla, I have selected the Saracen Clorinda as the third example of a worthy opponent. She exemplifies how, within the counter-reformated spirit, a female warrior characterized by infidelity will transform into a symbol of Christian power. Clorinda is one of the protagonists of Tasso Gerusalemme Liberata. She arrives at Jerusalem at the Muslim's aid against the Crusaders. She distinguishes herself in the battlefield, performing great deeds, until, in a highly pathetic episode, she is killed by the Christian Tancred, a knight who loves her and is unaware of his opponent's identity. In the text, Clorinda embodies the noble values of idealized chivalry that make her a good enemy. Despite being a threatening opponent, she's capable of mercy and generosity, in addition to being extremely beautiful, brave, strong, and valiant. Most images that see Clorinda as a protagonist illustrate two specific episodes of the poem. Her arrival in Jerusalem in the second canto and her death in the twelfth. Both episodes are emblematic in the discussion of Clorinda as a beloved enemy. In the first episode, upon her arrival in Jerusalem, Florinda encounters a crowd witnessing the impending execution of two young Christians named Sophronia and Olindo. Unjustly accused of stealing a Virgin Mary icon by King Alatin, they face a fiery fate. Florinda's compassion is steered by Sophronia's strength and peaceful acceptance of death, leading her to convince Aladdin to spare their lives. This act of pietas marks the beginning of Clorinda's transformation from enemy to a lie, which ultimately unfolds in her death. Clorinda's death is the second episode widely represented in painting. The virago is depicted agonizing after the fa fatal encounter with Tancred. The Christian warrior is instead depicted while he baptizes her. But why does a Saracen warrior who killed many Christians deserve to be baptized? In the poem, just before the fateful duel with Tancred, Florinda had discovered the truth about her origins. Through a genealogical plot twist, Tasso tells the reader that she was the daughter of the Christian king of Ethiopia, but, unlike her parents, she was born with white skin. Her mother feared that this trait would be seen as evidence of infidelity and consequently entrusted baby Clorinda to a servant. The servant, against their mother's wishes, raised Clorinda as a Muslim. Aware of her true story, at the end of her life, Clorinda asks Tancredi to baptize her. Through the baptism, Tasso tells us, the warrior turns from Rubella, rebel, to Ancella, God's handmaid. Her past as an infidel gets cancelled by the purifying water. Tasso thus adds another layer in the, 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 in the direction of a positive interpretation of the warrior woman. He assigns her a sacred dimension. This is clearly emphasized in paintings. As an example, in this early interpretation of Florinda's death by Domenico Tintoretto, the general atmosphere, with the dove coming from the orange clouds of the dawn, perfectly depicts the moment of the narration in which Clorinda, according to the narrator, seems to be thinking, heaven is opening, I depart in peace. To 
conclude, in these three case studies, I have explored some declinations of the Amazonian myth in late medieval and early modern times. I have firstly focused on how, from the 13th century onward, the Amazons undergo reinterpretations by French authors and Boccaccio, incorporating elements from the courtly tradition. When they admit their physical inferiority and abandon their belligerence, they transform into model wives, transitioning from enemies to allies. I then focused on Camilla, who from her, her original portrayal in the Aeneid, challenges the notion of geographical otherness associated with the Amazons. As an Italic queen who dies for her homeland, she can be interpreted as a symbol of patriotism. Finally, I analyzed how epic heroines can evolve from enemies to a lie through conversion. This happened in Tasso's work, written in a time in which literature was being reshaped by the imperatives of the Counter-Reformation. In this poem, the Saracen Clorinda, after being baptized, turns into an Ancilla Domini, a handmaid of the Lord. There might be multiple reasons for the re-evaluation of female warrior imagery explored in this talk, but I will only focus on one particular aspect. The characters we have examined thus far are fictional viragos, described from the outset as inherently different from the book of regular women destined for the management of the household. They are exceptions, and as such, they can be celebrated for their bravery and virility, features not commonly attributed to their gender. Torquato Tasso, despite giving weapons to two women in his Gerusalemme Liberata, in his most important contribution to the Querelle de Femme, Il Discorso della Virtù Femminile Donesca, agrees with Aristotle that fortitude is without doubt the virtue of men. Tasso is not an exception. Outside of fiction, fortitude, strength, and the ability to fight are rarely considered compatible with the female gender, and claims of women's physical inferiority resonated in the political writings of the time. Authors such as Moderata Fonte and Lucrezia Marinella openly challenged these views, highlighting the imbalance between the situation of actual women and the utopistic stories of fictional viragos. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, well, <clears throat> and then we go forth to conclude these three intense days of talks and um, inspirations. And we are very proud to and honored to have here to conclude the, the conference, Professor Vera Fortunati. Magari. Professor Vera Fortunati will talk about um, Le due Giuditte di Lavinia Fontana dall'interpretazione religiosa contro riformata alle Fanfort. Allora, io parlo in italiano perché il mio inglese è veramente una vergogna e, e vorrei dire due cose del mio intervento, perché il mio intervento non è panoramico. Io parlerò di Bologna, degli anni che vanno dal 1570-1600, perché quello che mi interessa, arrivata alla mia età, è di capire come funziona il cervello, la mente, la penna, il cuore di una donna artista. Di una donna artista che parte sempre da, un, da una condizione di inferiorità, nel senso che non, è ancora, eh, non può ancora entrare nel, nell'accademia, quindi non può liberarsi da quella che è l'educazione familiare e quindi è dentro eh, profondamente e intensamente al 
al clima familiare. Io lo, lo posso confessare oramai, sono arrivata alla Vigna Fontana studiando profondamente il padre. Se non avessi studiato il padre non avrei mai capito forse la fatica ma anche la novità che, che questa donna, questa giovane donna, fa per prendere il meglio della cultura e paterna e anche per dire paterna, adesso vedremo, significa dire la cultura universitaria e la cultura anche dell'Accademia di Bocchi e anche l'azione pastorale del Cardinale Paleotti, farle tutte sue e quindi crearsi proprio una propria individualità. Mi ha molto scandalizzato l'uscita nel, nel mondo mi sembra anglosassone, di questo libro che parlava di un mondo senza uomini. È la più grande stupidaggine che noi possiamo dire. E le più grandi stupidaggini che sono state scritte, e mi permetto di dirlo alla mia età, sulla storia delle donne artiste, sono sempre state quelle di, eh, di volere diminuire l'importanza dell'uomo. Non si va avanti così. Si va avanti a un certo momento riuscendo a capire e confrontando i risultati di Lavinia con quelli del padre, con quelli di Annibale Caracci, con quelli di Agostino Caracci, e allora si, ci si rende conto che in certi momenti, non sempre, Lavinia è più grande anche di Annibale Caracci nel fare i, i ritratti, ma questo è un percorso che si può fare se si restringe l'ambito e si studia profondamente il tessuto storico, culturale, politico, letterario, religioso di un segmento, perché quando tu ti sei impadronita di un metodo allora lo puoi applicare anche in altri, ma facendo dei percorsi, diciamo così, eh, oppure ti accorgerai che certe posizioni sentimentali, politiche, religiose, in declinazioni diverse, si sono poi presentate in altri momenti storici. Però il rapporto di un artista donna la capisci nella sua grandezza proprio se hai la conoscenza di un clima come se tu vivessi tra il 1570 e il 1600 a Bologna. Ecco, allora il mio eh, è questo per dire che vi parlerò di, di, di poche cose e partirò proprio dal ciclo che mh, eh, ho visto già proiettato e, e interpretato eh, in maniera magistrale anche dal, da chi mi ha preceduto, cioè dal ciclo delle storie di Camilla in Palazzo Bo in Palazzo Poggi. Però Poggi, la committenza, il soggetto anomalo, mi permettono poi di entrare dentro come vi ho, a un clima preciso. E allora andiamo a cercare, a vedere se ce la faccio. Aspetti, dopo devo tornare indietro. A un clima preciso, che è il clima appunto di Nicolò dell'Abate che nel 1550 viene chiamato a Bologna da, eh, da, da Giovan Battista Poggi. A voi questo nome non dice niente, ma nella storia del momento Poggi è un personaggio molto importante. È stato definito politropos e perirudditus, cioè era questo cardinale che eh, per tutta la sua vita la spesa tra le nunziature apostoliche e la carriera curiale, ma è anche amico di Achille Bocchi e quindi è dentro a un circolo culturale molto importante da conoscere. Perché eh, Achille Bocchi era una sorta di Umberto Eco del momento, era un personaggio che era a conoscenza di Erasmo da Rotterdam, e nella sua accademia in via Goito potevano entrare ebrei, protestanti, protestanti, cioè non c'è ancora, siamo, siamo, eh, non c'è anco, stato ancora il, concilio, la, il, il finale del concilio di Trento, ma ci sono già tante forme più o meno riformate legate al procedimento religioso che si sta sviluppando al, al di là eh, delle Alpi. 
e quindi e anche diciamo posizioni filosofiche contrastanti tra, neo, tra neoplatonismo e aristotelismo quindi è un mondo variegato è una cultura di sincre, sincretica cioè che cerca proprio di unire l'immaginario pagano all'immaginario cristiano e cerca di trovare nei miti del passato delle valenze morali e dei simboli religiosi. Eh, Sylvie Beguin, che ha studiato a lungo eh, con questo diciamo, affresco, con questo ciclo decorativo, con Enrica Languimir, in occasione proprio del restauro della, che, si è, che è avvenuto appunto eh, nei primi anni del 90 a Bologna, e si, si domandavano come mai, quale destinazione avesse un soggetto come questo in, una, in, in un palazzo di un ecclesiastico. E se la sono domandati a lungo e non sono riuscite a capire, diciamo così, e chi, può, chi può avere suggerito c'era chi ci diceva il Poggi era per Eruditus era stato diciamo, il, il direttore della biblioteca vaticana per molti anni ma dicevano ma cosa c'entra Camilla e perché Camilla allora è vero che eh, c'è stato Agrippa che è un, uno studioso che, che, che ha detto il mito patriottico e può anche darsi, ma è anche vero che poi questa sala si colloca con altre sale affrescate eh, da eh, Nicolò dell'Abate. E allora è venuta fuori che la Sylvie Beguin, che l'ha studiato una vita, e mi sembra anche giusto, confrontare il mito patriottico con quello che eh, dice anche Enrica Laugmir, che sostiene appunto che eh, il libro undicesimo dell'Eneide sarebbe stato suggerito a Poggi da, eh, addirittura da un suo amico, da, un suo, da, un, da, da uno che viveva nell'Accademia di Via Goito, che era eh, Sebastiano Corrado, che era un umanista che in, proprio in questi anni, nel 1545, diventava insegnante nell'Università di Bologna. E, e, Entrando dentro, quindi qui non c'è il tempo, nel, nel complesso che lo stiamo studiando da tanto tempo, nella complicato immaginario di Achille Botti, può anche darsi, eh, le, eh, confrontando il simbolo di, che, eh, che Achille Botti dedica a Corrado, che oltre al significato pro, diciamo, patriottico ci sia anche un significato morale. Cioè che eh, ci sia appunto, le, che Camilla rappresenti la vittoria della virtù su tutte le, le travaux, cioè su tutte le fatiche che l'uomo fa nella sua vita. E che quindi Poggi, in un certo senso, nel mito di Camilla si, eh, si identifica. Perché vi dico tutto questo? Perché a Palazzo Poggi lavora anche Fontana, perché Fontana, il padre della nostra Lavinia, era amicissimo di Achille Bocchi, faceva tutti i disegni per le incisioni dei simboli. Quindi la mia ipotesi, che penso sia anche verissimile, che tutta l'educazione umanistica e anche artistica di Lavinia Fontana sia della famiglia del padre. E, il pa e quindi la casa del padre per la nostra Lavinia è Accademia, dove lei impara appunto eh, le, che cosa sono i colori, a preparare i colori, eccetera, ma anche umanistica, cioè che Achille Bocchi in casa Fontana viene nominato, avete capito? E lei molto presto può aver visto questi, questi ah, affreschi. E quindi restarne veramente profondamente, diciamo, colpita, anche perché il padre Prospero è amicissimo anche di Giorgio Vasari, collabora con Giorgio Vasari. E Giorgio Vasari, e lo vedremo poi in ultimo, è il primo che si interessa delle donne artiste, anche di una grande artista, la prima scultrice in Europa, che è Properzia De Rossi. Quindi è evidente che nella formazione umanistica di Lavinia Fontana 
forse questi affreschi hanno contatto. Hanno contatto perché? Perché è una figura femminile che si staccava, eh, diciamo così, dalle, da che cosa? Nel 1586 esce pubblicato Tommaso Garzoni le storie delle, 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 delle donne illustri della scrittura sacra. Quindi vedete, è uno stimolo per entrare dentro all'Antico Testamento con una libertà mentale abbastanza nuova perché è vero che, la che eh, a Bologna poi non abbiamo tanto contro riforma, ma abbiamo la riforma cattolica, come appunto ha detto un grande storico Paolo Prodi, promossa da Paleotti. E il padre, Fontana, era consulente di fiducia di Gabriele Paleotti nello che sta scrivendo il discorso del 1582. Vedete come... Che sinergia di interventi ci sono nella formazione di Lavinia Fontana. Ma queste sinergie di interventi ci sono nella formazione di una Elisabetta Sirani, che l'Edalina Modestia è riuscita proprio a mettere in evidenza. Quindi il mio intervento è soltanto per suggerire sempre di restringere il campo, non di, allarga, non di allargarlo, ma e di scavarlo bene per poter capire come funziona proprio la mente, il cervello, il cuore e quindi anche le mani di un artista che parte prima appunto dell'entrata in accademia con parità di diritti e anche nelle università. Ecco, allora, entriamo in Palazzo Poggi e cerchiamo anche di, di essere brevi. Per non, per non appunto affaticarvi. Innanzitutto, stile iconografia, io sono stata della scuola di Longhi, delle scuole di Francesco Arcangeli, li abbiamo sempre unite. Forse è sbagliato, non lo so. Quindi io parlerò di stile, ma anche di iconografia. Per farvi capire che eh, lì un'interpretazione iconografica nuova è legata anche al, alla innovità di uno stile. E a Bologna nel 1550 Nicolò dell'Abate porta una novità rivoluzionaria, cioè il dipingere sul muro non più con il disegno e con il cartone, ma direttamente. Quindi è una pittura veloce, una pittura bozzata. E noi appunto che abbiamo seguito il restauro, la tecnica proprio del restauro, ci, rendiamo, ci rendevamo conto proprio della velocità e ed è un'artista velocissima anche nel, nella creazione delle, de, delle sue opere, Lavinia. Quindi Nicolò entra nell'immaginario di Lavinia per due ragioni. Per presentarci questa figura nuova che lei probabilmente non conosceva ancora di Camilla e per, e per diciamo così, eh, vedere anche uno stile nuovo che non era fai il disegno, fai il cartone, fai la sinopia, portalo. Cioè ehm, era una tecnica completamente diversa, una tecnica rapida, una tecnica bossata, una tecnica che, sapeva, um, che aveva un, un, un gusto legato a Coreggio, a Parmigianino, ma soprattutto anche a Dosso Dossi, cioè alla grande tradizione veneta che era penetrata a, a Ferrara. Quindi iconografia nuova, perché è diversa da quella che in maniera mirabile ci ha fatto vedere prima la dottoressa del, de, della Rocca di, di Scandiano, perché è un'iconografia ed è una, è una tecnica che si lega proprio all'epica moderna, perché erano molto... Eh, Fontana, Prospero, il padre, era, legherà, era legato ad Achille Bocchi, quindi a tutti i letterati che frequentavano questa accademia, che aveva un odore, eh, ne, diciamo così, di, di ribellione nei confronti del, dell'accademia universitaria. Era un qualcosa di sperimentale nuovo, questo sincretismo religioso, politico, culturale portato avanti da Achille Bocchi. E pensate, lo stesso cardinale Paleotti è stato al, ha frequentato l'Accademia di Bocchi. 
tutti e quindi quando poi arriva ad essere in questi anni eh, ufficialmente il vescovo di Bologna eh, fa un riformismo moderato che non ha niente a che vedere con la controriforma tridentina eh, che è più, con la quale appunto noi siamo sempre abituati a dialogare. E qui vediamo appunto rap rapidamente quest queste scene e queste fotografie, spero che siano venute abbastanza bene, sì, sono fatte appunto dopo il restauro, perché il restauro anche ci, ci aiuta a rileggere proprio le opere. Qui vedete è il, il padre che con la bambina in mano, Camillo, anche questa, capite che lo, la doveva colpire, lei che vedeva nel padre il fulcro della sua educazione, vedere questo tiranno di, che tiene in mano la, la bambina piccola e perché appunto i, i cittadini appunto lo stanno cacciando e nella seconda scena, vedete, è, è lì che prende, lancia la bambina con l'ancilotto nel, nel fiume dall'altra parte della, della riva della, de, della, di questo fiume a, a, a Maseno e lui vedete, e lui vedete che, che viene sempre ripreso in, come, come diciamo da una macchina fotografica più volte quindi era anche un modo di raccontare questo mito antico dove vedre, vedremo già eh, eh, e l'abbiamo studiato io, mia sorella Vita e Bigalli in un diciamo, convegno tenuto a Bologna nel 2008 che è uscito poi in, in un libro a, a cura di Gilberta Golinelli dove c'è stata appunto questa decostruzione e riappropriazione di questo mito antico secondo l'ottica appunto eh, delle, di, degli studi di genere. E andiamo avanti e spero di non annoiarvi troppo, vi faccio vedere dei particolari perché è evidente che lei non è soltanto, diciamo così, eh, come quando noi era, da piccoli ci portavano al cinema, no? E ci piaceva sì, il, diciamo, il fatto, ma ci piaceva molto anche come veniva rappresentato. Io mi ricordo certe scene di film che ho visto quando avevo 9 o 10 anni. C'era il fatto, ma c'era anche l'impatto emotivo di un'immagine che mi veniva rappresentata in una maniera nuova e vuoi che la vigna non sia stata impressionata eh, da questa descrizione minuziosa ma nello stesso tempo istintiva di questo fiume di, queste, di questi tramonti di questo paesaggio senz'altro perché dopo la ritroviamo nella sua opera e a me questa qui io ce la vedo davanti, avete capito, la vigna fontana davanti a questa scena con questo padre. Era prospero per lei? Prospero per lei era, era tutto, perché la, la, la portava via da, da, da una vita di noia quotidiana. E qui vedete Prospero che, con que, che fa, diciamo così, eh, alimentare eh, con latte di una, di una giumenta eh, la bambina. E vedete qui c'è proprio il sincretismo culturale di Bocchi, perché questo mito dell'Amazzone, che è un mito selvaggio, è un mito ombroso, un, un mito che sa di boschi eh, ancestrali, eh, di, di sangue, e invece qui eh, viene interpretato in, in una, in una, con una solennità silvestre che veramente eh, la, la, per me la, la deve avere colpita moltissimo. E adesso andiamo avanti perché è evidente che io devo arrivare alla, alla Giuditta e quindi mi interessano moltissimo anche le scene di guerra. Queste scene dove la regina di, dei Volgi e, e, dunque, sta uccidendo gli, gli etruschi e qui veramente è lei a cavallo, vedete, con un, questa veste gialla che fa vedere questo corpo androgeno e qui eh, non, non volevo an annoiarvi perché poi devo arrivare al, al, alla Giuditta, io ho trovato tutti i riferimenti proprio a sculture antiche che sono conservate nei, nei palazzi romani d'epoca, di questa epoca, e che sono state riprodotte e, 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 e coltivate da Ulisse Aldrovandi. Ma ehm, perché volevo 
farvi capire il metodo che mi interessa, cioè come la vigna portata dal padre si sia, si è, abbia potuto interessarsi a questi affreschi. E quindi che, che, che cosa gli, gli avrà interessato? Il coraggio, la forza, le, la lealtà e anche, diremo così, il modo, vedete, perché qui viene rappresentato tre volte, là in fondo all'elmo in testa, alla lancia, ma queste cose sono state dette benissimo dalla dottoressa precedente che si è interessata proprio dell'iconografia della guerriera. Il mio compito è molto più umile, è quello di farvi vedere come in questo affresco ci sia un dinamismo, il dinamismo che lei forse provava quando leggeva l'Ariosto. Quindi c'è la fantasia dell'epica moderna, diciamo così, intesa, rivissuta, eh, con il movimento prospettico, compositivo, ma anche di tocco, avete capito? Quindi c'è una rapidità delle immagini. Per esempio il cavallo assomiglia moltissimo a Parmigianino, eh, questo invece... Eh, Dorso, questa invece figura vista dal, dal di dietro mi ricorda Pordenone, ma l'insieme è completamente nuovo, cioè perché si passa da un'immagine all'altra come, come, eh, come fosse appunto un, una fotografia, insomma, un, un dinamismo fotografico. E anche, anche qui vedete, aspetto, date un attimo. Ecco, per esempio, eh, questi tagli, questi tagli così che poi anche lei farà così tremendamente, eh, diciamo così, forti, no? Lei che sta uccidendo l'etrusco, vedete, lì in primo piano. E lei là che sta in fondo con questo bosco, c'è la fiaba no? Dele, di Ariosto, lei leggera, pende dal cavallo, per andare a uccidere il figlio di Auno e che sarà poi la sua rovina perché poi il padre la masserà. Eccola, e qui invece, e poi la grandezza di Nicolò, qual è? Quella di non mettere l'uccisione in primo piano, ma di portare nella costruzione compositiva dell'affresco, cioè dal, dal, dal guerriero col cavallo in primo piano, così tagliato, noi siamo costretti con lo sguardo ad andare là in fondo e a vedere l'uccisione di, di Camilla. E poi c'è questo straordinario che si sarà anche commossa forse la vigna a, a vedere la morte di Camilla e l'Amazone H. Soror, dice appunto Virgilio, che eh, insieme ad, ad un'altra Amazone la, la sorreggono. Non vi faccio vedere l'ultimo che è stato definito l'apoteosi, ma in realtà sono le Amazzoni che portano, eh, diciamo così, eh, Camilla morta davanti a Diana che appare su, su, una, su una nuvola perché quello è tutto rifatto. E quindi eh, non, eh, io sono stata abituata ad una scuola che ciò che è troppo rifatto, troppo, che, che, che non dà il senso dell'autenticità, dell eh, è difficile da, da interpretare. Ma mi sembra che abbiamo, dal mio punto di vista, che, che non sono un iconografa, ma cerco di collegare iconografia e stile, soprattutto cerco di capire che cosa può avere provato la vigna quando accompagnata dal padre è entrata nella, in questa sala di Palazzo Poggi. Quindi per farvi capire che nella formazione di un artista ci sono tante, tante, diciamo, incursioni esterne di cui appunto possiamo forse conoscere qualcosa, qualcosa sapete, perché il passato come lo dice anche a Ginsburg, ci presenta sempre delle varianti eh, che ci sfuggono, è sempre un mistero il passato, però possiamo capire piccole cose soltanto se restringiamo il campo e cominciamo a scavare in campi ristretti. E adesso devo tornare indietro perché ho un documento, non me lo sono inventato tutto, perché queste idee mi sono venute? Perché mi è stato presentato un piccolissimo rame dove, appunto, di collezione privata, dove 
e la vigna fontane siamo negli anni dal 1570 al 1575 mi dipinge eh, eh, questo appunto su, su rame questo matrimonio mistico ma dietro al rame c'è questa incisione all'acqua forte questo è palazzo bocchi e allora le ipotesi erano soltanto due o nella bottega del padre c'era questo, diciamo così, eh, questo mh, rame, perché il padre Prospero aveva fatto questo disegno che poi è stato inciso all'acquaforte come tutte le altre volte da Giulio Bonasone, oppure eh, l'aveva perché è, è su il disegno. Allora cosa vuol dire? Perché lei prende e lavora? Avete capito? Allora da qui... Io sono, mi sono permessa di fare l'ipotesi che anche Bocchi, Palazzo Bocchi e quindi anche Palazzo Poggi, perché Poggi è un amico di Bocchi dove ci sono le storie di Camilla, possono avere interessato la genialità di Lavinia Fontana. E questa è un'ipotesi, naturalmente il documento c'è. E qua ci sono dei particolari eh, che andrebbero tutti spiegati. E adesso entriamo invece negli anni 90. Negli anni 90 abbiamo questa prima versione di, della Giuditta che si conserva a ritiro, a, nella fondazione del ritiro di San Pellegrino. La commissione, eh, possiamo dire, l'ha studiato anche la Stefania Biancani, perché noi poi a, a Bologna studiamo queste cose nel centro di documentazione che io ho l'onore di avere iniziato e quindi di dirigere ancora anche se sono un dinosauro oramai della storia dell'arte ma è portato avanti appunto da queste giovani e bravissime ricercatrici di cui appunto Stefania Biancani è stata da sempre la prima donna possiamo dire la prima protagonista e allora naturalmente qui eh, possiamo per semplificare un po' per non confondere le idee, per arrivare subito a leggere analisi iconografica e analisi stilistica e per capire come, come eh, in questo in, in, Giuditta lei sia profondamente legata sia alla precettistica di Palotti, che sta riformando l'arte sacra a Bologna, servendosi del dialogo con gli artisti e, e in primis col padre Prospero, sia anche e capire anche come lei ha delle radici religiose ancora più, più antiche. Cioè partiamo subito dal fatto che apparteneva a una delle famiglie più importanti di Bologna, che sono la famiglia Ratta. La famiglia Ratta ha avuto nel tempo rapporti sia con la vigna sia col padre Prospero. E... La, che, chi sia questa appunto persona, perché molti hanno su supposto senza nessun documento storico che sia la moglie di Carlo Malvasia diventata vedova però non ci sono documenti e, e, e quindi fo forse è me, è me, è mentre la e questo secondo me in questo momento che momento in cui sono diciamo così impegnata a farvi vedere un metodo più che eh, delle cose delle, della, de, dello studio della committenza che mi sembra sia importante ma fino a un certo punto qui mi sembra molto importante invece vedere come lei segue da vicino proprio il testo di questo libro della Giuditta io non lo sapevo, l'ho imparato da poco che questo libro della Giuditta è, cons è considerato sacro dai cattolici e dagli ortodossi apocrifo invece dai protestanti e dagli ebrei. Quindi era un libro, in, era un'iconografia che, eh, che nella controriforma è molto importante perché molti, ad esempio anche eh, per il quadro di Caravaggio, eh, pensano appunto che, sia, eh, il, il, che il Giuditta sia la Chiesa che trionfa su Oloferne 
che, che sarebbe appunto Lutero e quindi il, il, il protestantesimo. Quindi ci sono anche delle interpretazioni che vanno in, in questa direzione. Lei invece, vedete, è molto vicina al testo sacro. Lo segue anche se un, con qualche licenza che adesso vedremo. Innanzitutto non sceglie il, il momento cruciale della decapitazione. Lei è in primo piano, il, la testa decapitata di Oloferne è sulla tavola e dietro, vedete, alle sue spalle c'è Oloferne che però ha ancora il braccio in alto, come a significare che la, de, la decapitazione è appena successa. Lei, vedete, nel viso ha le labbra socchiuse, cioè è una preghiera muta, appassionante, verso quel Dio che l'ha aiutata, le ha suggerito la via per liberare la sua città di Betulia assediata da Oloferne e adesso viene quasi da piangere pensando a Gaza perché la, eh, la tiene senza acqua e senza, e senza cibo. E allora lei appunto ringrazia eh, Dio di averla, di averla ai, aiutata e quindi vedete è un notturno innanzitutto e in questo notturno noi vediamo questi occhi brillanti di un appassionato amore, cioè è un'interpretazione mistica. C'è un una forte tensione mistica in questo volto e anche, e anche in questo gesto che si svolge in questo notturno e, e con qualche licenza, perché vedete la giovane Ancella, eh, lei è uscita dalla tenda, ma la giovane Ancella sta strappando questi tendaggi e se uno legge nel libro di Giuditta, questo gesto lo fa Giuditta, non fa l'Ancella che non deve entrare nell'alcova ma che è all'esterno quindi è un'interpretazione iconografica non diciamo così dirett direttamente diciamo che direttamente prende il testo ma con delle varianti ma quello che mi interessa è proprio il notturno questa capacità nuova per Bologna nuovissima di rappresentare la notte ciò che accade di notte e perché subito dopo, do, qualche anno dopo, qui forse siamo verso tra il 1595, dopo torniamo lì, dopo, dopo torniamo indietro, la fa in questo straordinario quadro che a detta di Andrea Emiliani, che fra gli studiosi, gli storici di Bologna è stato uno dei più importanti, lo definiva il quadro tra i quadri più importanti del 600, tra fine 500 e inizio 600 in Europa. Quindi una cosa straordinaria. Ma da dove viene? Ecco un gran... la capacità della donna di non credersi chissà chi, cioè me... e quindi di sapere che parte da una diciamo così, condizione minoritaria e quindi c'è l'esigenza, ma nei nostri tempi all'università l'avevamo anche noi eh, era tutta un'università molto maschile quindi sapevamo che dovevamo studiare il doppio il triplo se non il quadruplo per essere prese sul serio perché altrimenti dicevano sì carina graziosa eccetera eh. quante volte le abbiamo sentito no? ma adesso ci ridiamo sopra perché, e li ringraziamo anche, perché ci hanno obbligato a leggere, andare negli archivi, andare nelle biblioteche, a, 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 a andare nei musei, anche più periferici, per vedere. Io, che sono cattolica, credente, praticante in tutte le sagrestie, tutti mi dicevano, ma dove vai? In sagrestia. E non capivano che andavo a vedere, perché nelle sagrestie delle chiese di Bologna si trovano dei calvar, dei, dei caracci eh, sconosciuti, avete capito? Ecco, lei allora che cosa, si, cosa guarda? Innanzitutto, qui c'è anche in maniera antropologica, so che non serve, non è dentro al tema, ma dopo torniamo subito nel tema. E, lei ha avuto tutti questi parti notturni, 
nel 1595 dice che a Luni a un quarto gli è nato questo figlio. Quindi sa benissimo che cos'è un parto notturno, ma probabilmente non ha ancora trovato il modello a cui ispirarsi, ma dal pozzuolo l'ha trovato. L'ha confrontato con questo Jacopo Bassano, questa natività, più o meno coeva cronologicamente con quella di Lavinia, perché? Perché nelle collezioni bolognesi, ce lo dice Malvasia e gli studi appunto eh, che sono venuti do dopo, nelle collezioni bolognesi Jacopo Bassano e la sua scuola sono molto presenti in e a queste date proprio nel nei Marchesi Facchinetti. Quindi, avendo visto Nicolò dell'Abate, la novità di Nicolò, che non era legata a Roma, Nicolò dell'Abate è, è legato al Pordenone, cioè a un michelangiolismo riformato in chiave veneta. Lei si rende conto che ci sono i, i caracci, che la novità dei caracci sta a Venezia e che quindi anche lei in qualche modo deve aggiornarsi e quindi arrivare ad un notturno proprio preso dalla pittura veneta più o meno di questo tipo presente a, a, a Bologna. Ma torniamo indietro e vediamo altro modello con cui lei si confronta, ma prendendo le giuste distanze. E questo Agostino Caracci della quadreria di Palazzo Magnani, più o meno contemporaneo alla Giuditta che abbiamo visto prima, dove vedete eh, c'è Giuditta, però Giuditta, vedete, eh sì, è quasi, non dico scontenta, ma è, insomma, non, è, partecipa fino a un certo punto, è quasi, non dico neanche disgustata, ma non ha quell'empito mistico eh, che anima di ardore, un ardore che è anche l'ardore della luce notturna il volto appunto della Giuditta naturalmente da un da punto di vista compositivo Agostino Caracci ha, da, ha insegnato la, una certa struttura compositiva a Lavinia ma Lavinia è più moderna e lo vediamo proprio nel, nel confronto e poi ci guardiamo senza deprimere perché quello che a me eh, quando ero giovane mi scocciava moltissimo nella storia dell'arte, quando i paragoni si fanno per dire se è più bravo l'uno o più bravo l'altro. E invece no, il paragone si fa per cercare di comprendere cosa è arrivato uno e che cosa è arrivato l'altro. Perché altrimenti si diventa dei partigiani abb abbastanza storicamente non validi. Ecco, eh, allora, abbiamo visto eh, l'accensione mistica della Giuditta di, eh, Pe... dell'oratorio di San Pellegrino, poi vedremo qual è la fonte di questo misticismo e la confrontiamo con l'altra grande donna artista e mi ha telefonato, mi ha telefonato, sono, si vede da, da, da lì che sono di un'altra generazione, mi ha mandato un'email eh, la mia collaboratrice, la professoressa Irene Graziani, che finalmente non si parla più in Spagna la colazione Thyssen di signore, ma di maestre dell'arte. Eh. E allora questo mi ha fatto piacere perché tutti gli studi che abbiamo fatto fino adesso finalmente sono arrivati a far capire che non sono signore dell'arte, sono maestre che stanno, quando sono serie, alla pari con gli altri né di più né di meno, alla pari. Ecco, e qui e vediamo l'altra grande fede Galizia. La cosa che ha turbato dei grandissimi storici come Agosti e Schioppa nell'ultima mostra dedicata a fede Galizia era che non si rendevano conto perché eh, questa serenità, questa diremmo così, assenza di qualsiasi fremito sentimentale o di passione in questa giuditta. E, e allora appunto a me sembra di aver trovato una ragione perché eh, 
studiando appunto il, soprattutto il testamento, lei mostra di essere molto attaccata ai teatini. E allora la spiritualità dei teatini mette come, diciamo così, eh, pietra ang angolare proprio questo abbandono della propria volontà per unirsi alla volontà divina. Ed è, e quindi questo deve, diciamo così, essere subito seguito dalla soppressione di qualsiasi fremito improvviso di passione o di sentimento. Quindi è evidente che in questa straordinaria ossessiva descrizione dei particolari e in questa, diciamo, imperturbabilità di Giuditta che ha fatto una cosa tremenda, ha decapitato la testa di un uomo, sia pure il tiranno, ma è una cosa terribile, sia pure per liberare la propria patria, ma è un delitto tremendo. Lei invece non, il, il sangue non l'ha contaminata, la tragedia non l'ha toccata proprio perché vive in questo, diciamo così, percorso spirituale di algida ascetismo mistico. Mentre la nostra la nostra, diciamo, Giuditta è diversa. È diversa perché? Perché qui, tra il 1413 e il 1463, vive una strana, straordinaria santa, che è stata fatta poi santa nel Settecento, mistica, che si chiama Caterina Vigri, che è, diciamo, per la zona bolognese, la prima leggendaria artista. E, in questo, e il padre, ancora una volta vedete, i padri non, non si possono eliminare in un certo periodo della, della, della storia delle donne artiste, ha lavorato moltissimo per questo diciamo, eh, convento del Corpus Domini dove andavano tutte le, le donne della più alta nobiltà bolognese e, e diciamo, avevano una regola ascetica ma molto umana molto diciamo legata a un sentimento affettivo ed è per questo che erano amate e protette dal cardinale Paleo. E allora vedete che quel cerchio magico che io prima ho fatto incomincia ad essere sempre più importante e io credo che in queste labbra socchiuse che stanno pregando, ringraziando in questi occhi così brillanti di una di un'accensione mistica ci sia proprio questo ricordo di questa leggendaria artista che era, era musicista, era miniatrice, era diciamo così eh, scrittrice, ha scritto un testo molto importante a proposito dell'obbedienza femminile, no? che mette appunto in crisi il criterio che, bisogna, che le donne devono sempre ubbidire, quindi con un discernimento tra ciò che è bene ubbidire e ciò che, ma, e ciò che invece non si deve ubbidire con un, in una modernità è molto nuova, molto sconcertante, ma questo è un discorso che ci potrebbe portare molto lontano. Ecco, ecco. dieci minuti, ma adesso vado in fretta. Ecco, e siamo ar arrivati all'ACME. Quello eh, sulla sinistra è prima del restauro, quello sulla destra è dopo il restauro recentissimo che è stato fatto ed è stata una scoperta straordinaria. Qui siamo, eh, abbiamo scoperto che la data 1600 è stata messa dopo, però anche se è stata messa dopo, questo è un dipinto che appartiene proprio alla, alla, alla fine del secolo. Cioè quando lei ha maturato la conoscenza dei caracci, probabilmente è andata a Venezia eh, proprio sotto lo stimolo di, di Annibale e di Agostino Caracci e qui veramente eh, ha un'interpretazione innovativa del, de, del testo sacro perché vedete innanzitutto ci rappresenta ormai il finale dell'atto tragico lei è diciamo così in primo piano ha in una mano la testa decapitata, dall'altra ha questo, diciamo, spada. E vedete, guarda lo spettatore. Quella di Agostino non guardava. Quella prima di Giuditta guardava in alto il Signore che l'aveva aiutata. Questa invece guarda, 
in maniera sfrontata, agguerri- non dico agguerrita, ma senza nessuna paura allo spettatore, come per dire sono consapevole di quello che ho fatto. E vedete anche l'ancella che ha questa specie di cane- eh, cesta che il nuovo, appunto, il nuovo restauro ha messo quasi in primo piano, con questi panni imboccati, pronta, destinata a nascondere la testa di Oloferne e anche lei guarda con complicità lo spettatore. Quindi è evidente che la Camilla, e poi vedremo anche subito Properzia De, De Rossi nel gran finale che faccio, sono dei messaggi non so se sia fan forte secondo appunto l'immagine classica e biblica che sarà in auge nella letteratura femminista in Europa nel Seicento ma senza dubbio è il messaggio di un artista che è consapevole del suo valore e che quindi entra con una libertà mentale che adesso ci sembra normale ma ai tempi di Paleotti molto innovativa, nel testo sacro, per dire che Giuditta è stata un'eroina consapevole di un destino che magari ha affidato le da Dio, ma che lei però, lei personalmente ha scelto, personalmente ha realizzato. Ci sarebbero molte cose da dire, ma mi preme di sottolineare che tutto questo è detto con una pittura straordinaria, guardate il volto, guardate con un lume otticamente medite- meditato, le perle del, dell'orecchino fanno ombra, con uno diciamo fulgore, uno splendore cromatico, perché noi siamo storici dell'arte, quindi queste cose ci infiammano quando le, le troviamo. E quindi il messaggio è un messaggio completamente nuovo e direi che viene... Guardate, vi faccio vedere soltanto questi, questi capolavori e soprattutto questo pendaglio dove c'è il pavone. E il pavone, secondo le illustri eh, diciamo, emblemi di, 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 di Ruscelli, è simbolo di lealtà, di generosità, di trasparenza, di, cioè di, di una donna vera, di una donna veramente e, e autenticamente coraggiosa e poi la perfezione proprio nella, nella diciamo mo, nella, nella definizione dei gioielli, de, dei broccati dei tessuti, dei veli che la fa famosa in, tutte, in, in tutta Europa è la ritrattista che viene proprio diciamo così ricercata anche per questo ecco, il modello che lei può avere visto è questo eh, ritratto di donna in veste di Giuditta, quindi è un cripto ritratto, ma vedete la differenza. Qui c'è questo naturalismo che, che, moderato di, di, Ag- di Agostino e che dà il senso appunto della verità, ma lei non guarda lo spettatore. È un po' come nell'altra sempre immagine di Giuditta, di Agostino. È fieramente chiusa in se stessa. Non c'è quella voglia di comunicare all'altro la consapevolezza di di aver fatto un qualcosa di grande. E che, ecco, e che forse non sono tanto lontana da quello che dico, cioè questa identificazione in fondo eh, della nostra appunto pittrice con la Giuditta per dire all'eventuale committente che lei è consapevole di essere un artista che vale pur nella normalità di una vita quotidiana perché lei è sposata, ha undici figli e quindi riesce ad essere una donna normale ma consapevole però di essere anche una grande artista e me l'ha data proprio la Babette Bon che nell'ultimo suo lavoro del 2021 sulle donne artiste mi dice appunto che probabilmente in questa Giuditta è, è, si nasconde il ritratto di Lavinia Fontana, confrontando questo volto con quello dell'autoritratto dell'Accademia di San Luca, e qui non mi soffermo, e con il ritratto appunto di Lavinia agli Uffizi. 
Quindi vedete come l'incontro giovanile che io presumo con Camilla, con questa donna che rompe tutta una tradizione, pur nella normalità di una vita di riforma cattolica, chiamiamola così, a Bologna, per gli, lei appunto riesce a dire appunto attraverso questo, nascondendosi in questa giuditta, quello che in fondo e lì lei si ricorda non soltanto della mistica ma si ricorda di Propersia de Rossi 1525 Bologna, cantiere di San Petronio dove lavorano in, dei grandissimi artisti come Tribolo l'allievo di Michelangelo eh, la, diciamo vi lavora Gerolamo da Treviso vi lavora eh, diciamo di, dei grandissimi scultori anche Zaccaria Zacchi lei appunto entra dentro e fa questa formella e qui ancora il padre c'entra perché il padre gli ha fatto leggere fin da piccola la vita che, che sia nella torrentiniana sia nella giuntina che eh, Vasari appunto dedica a questa prima scultrice bolognese che è veramente una fan forte lei in questa appunto formella si nasconde la nostra propersia e in queste braccia muscolose michelangiolesche, in questo contrapposto del, del corpo che la fa veramente emergere e apparire come prima protagonista e quindi un'interpretazione al femminile dell'episodio biblico e quando dico al femminile stanno, stanno nascendo adesso i libri di interpretazioni al femminile del, eh, del mondo biblico fatto da teologhe sia cattoliche che protestanti quindi vedete che siamo nel 1525 mentre vedete Giuseppe in cui si nasconde questo, questo amore infelice che lei avrebbe avuto secondo Vasari ma Vasari parla di lei come una misera donna eh? E, e, e dice che il gesto che fa è di donesca grazia, cioè non vuole nascondere la forza, la potenza propulsiva di, che c'è in questa figura femminile, in questa interpretazione al femminile dell'episodio biblico. È come se Propersia continuamente ci dica, lì in questa, in questa formella, in questa donna, si nasconde la, la mia consapevolezza di essere una grande scultrice e di aver avuto una vita irregolare sentimentalmente che io senza nessuna vergogna dico e che, sono, che ho una vita contro l'audabile Semores e lei muore di peste nell'ospedale Giobbe di San Giobbe dove venivano eh, diciamo così, eh, mo se morti dove, dove andavano gli ammalati di Sifilide. Quindi tutto questo non c'è nella vita di Vasari. Vasari ce la rappresenta bellissima, è innamorata in infelice, però non dice una parola della qualità stilistica, della novità iconografica di questa formella. Non dice una parola e lui forse l'aveva vista la rappresentazione dello stesso soggetto biblico nelle, nelle logge di Raffaello, invenzione di Raffaello e secondo la Nicole da Cos esecuzione di, G, di Giulio Romano, dove i protagonisti sono alla pari, qui no, qui vedete, la, fugge da lei, dalla seduzione e poi quello che mi piace ricordare è la novità del soggetto erotico al femminile, che nel 1525 è un'assoluta novità nel cantiere di Bologna, fatto da una femmina scult scultora, come si diceva, la Propersia, che aveva i suoi stravizi nella vita notturna bolognese, tra spiamassi e altre cose che è poco decoroso dire. Grazie. Any comment 
is superfluous because <clears throat> every time Professor Fortunati uh, delivers a lecture, um, it um, uh, really a methodological um, approach how we must study these um, arguments. <clears throat> the humility and the grandness, the knowledge and um, the big hearth uh, she has is that of the great scholar from whom we really need to take not only inspiration but a way of being because let me say that too often it happens that we do forget our ethical and uh, professional uh, duty. And uh, oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I was moved from your outstanding present presentation and the way you are narrating telling us the woman Lavinia the person the human Lavinia was is I think the way we have to look at all the women artists we will be studying, bumping in two, always thinking to your great lesson. Thank you, Professor Fortunati. Well, we've come to the end of our conference, though not the end of the activities still surrounding the conference. We have a visit to Galeria Spada, which will be taking place in... Uh, in, in a few minutes. So okay. We are just the time we go down and we gather at, at the courtyard and we go together there. Mm -hmm. um, just to remember that at 6.45 there will be served a tea and right. coffee. coffee, and that at seven there is a performance which will be held here in this hall. Seven thirty. They change the time. Okay. Seven thirty. Okay. 7 30. Doesn't matter. At okay. seven thirty, it will be here. <laughs> so yes, we thank you all for participating, for those here in person and those that have joined us remotely, and for to all the speakers for their wonderful papers. We hope that you'll be able to. Um, present them to us so that we can put them together in the volume that will be coming out in maybe two years' time, um, following on from the one that we've just presented here this week. And we look forward to seeing you all again next year when we will think of another theme. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you very much and and well done everybody. Thank you. So I need to thank Fabio because yes, I, let's go to Fabio because <laughs> without Fabio, well, this this conference wouldn't be possible at all. So thank you, Fabio. That, that's important one though, huh? so thank you so much for standing by us since a week, if not more. Thank you. <laughs>